August 9th regular meeting of the Board of County Commissioners to order. Thank you for being here this morning. Uh, we have a relatively short agenda this morning, Mr. Morkaheiski. Uh, we will have executive session this afternoon. Uh, with that, we'll move directly into the agenda. And I will ask, do we have any adjustments to the agenda? We don't. To the board? I see none. Then do we have any emergency business this morning? Very well. Then we'll move directly into public comments. Uh, people signed up for public comments will be asked to speak for three minutes. Uh, you can keep an eye on the clock on the wall. You'll not receive a warning when you're when it's, when it's you're approaching three minutes. When I say on the wall, I mean on the screen, not on the wall. We all know that clock's not on the right time. <laughs> so uh, watch the screen. You will not receive a warning at three minutes, uh, before your three minutes. Uh, at three minutes, we'll, you'll be asked to complete your, uh, uh, your sentence and we'll move along to the next speaker. Speakers who are present in Harris Hall will be taken first, followed by anyone who may have signed up for the uh, online queue. So today we have uh, one person signed up to speak in Harris Hall. Um, it's Stephen Riley. Mr. Riley, when I ask you to step with the mic, you'll have three minutes. Uh, please uh, conclude at three minutes. Stephen Riley, followed by online. Good morning. Uh, thank you for your time. I'm here regarding the situation that's been created uh, by Lane County in the uh, urban growth boundary. While the enforcement of code in that boundary has been turned over to the city of Eugene, uh, where Eugene is involved with this, they do not have the, the opportunity or means by which to give variances or make any changes. We have a situation now where our son, uh, his wife, and our and their young uh, baby's son have ended up out of uh, home because the place was sold out from under them. We're trying to provide a place for them to live uh, in their fifth wheel on the back of the property we own. There's uh, issues came up regarding the placement of the uh, not so much that, but the placement of the fence. The fence has to follow county guidelines. This would negate being able to have the, uh, the fifth wheel there. If it meets the city guidelines, there's no issue. We went to the county public works and we're told, sorry, we don't have any authority over that. That's up to the city. Went to the city, the city said, well, we enforce it, but we don't write the code. We have no authority to change the code. And we're getting kind of a, uh, a pass the buck situation. I've been told this has gone on for about 20 years. What has happened now is we are given no means of redress of government. Uh, there's no process in place to address these issues, to try to get a variance, uh, because everybody simply says, nothing we can do. Uh, the person at the county, <clears throat> Public Works, we initially contacted the front desk. I made a comment that, well, we're going to contact one of the county commissioners and name that person. We got a very condescending response of, well, whoever that is, and informed them that that was the commissioner, and no response to that. Uh, Right now, we're facing a lack of remedy with an issue that we have a deadline of August 10th to try to deal with. Uh, I want to thank publicly uh, Commissioner Farr. He's been very helpful in trying to get this issue dealt with, uh, and we're very grateful for that. Uh, this is an issue that does not just affect us. It affects literally tens of thousands of property owners within the urban growth boundary. And there is no means in place now or remedy. This needs to be corrected. Uh, I believe it'd be a simple thing to do. In much of the case, if this county would say, all right, we are adopting the building code of the city of Eugene and the urban growth boundary, that would eliminate much of the problem. That has not been done. So what can be done to uh, correct the situation would be greatly appreciated. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Riley. I have no one else signed up in Harris Hall to speak. After the online speakers have been have concluded, I'll ask if anyone else in Harris Hall wishes to address the Board of County Commissioners. Ms. Jones, do we have anyone signed up online? Thank you, Chair Farr. At this time, I do see we have two people registered to speak, but I, at this time, if you have registered to speak for public comment, please raise your virtual hand and I will call upon you for your public testimony. Uh, right now, I don't see either participant has raised their hand to speak, so I'll give it a moment to see if they would like to give comment. And in the meanwhile, I'll ask, is there anyone else in Harris Hall who wishes to address the Board of County Commissioners in public comment? 
I see none, Ms. Jones. Um, I did see a hand just go up. I saw uh, Michael Allen. Um, I will unmute your microphone and you may begin your public comment. You are self-muted. There you go. Yes. Uh, good morning. Uh, I'm new to this. Uh, uh, I'm Michael Allen in Florence. And I, I did want to give some comments regarding the levy that will be before you this afternoon. And I just need to know whether this is the appropriate time or do you have another public input uh, opportunity during the session that deals directly with the levy? Mr. Allen, this time will be appropriate. And Ms. Jones, can you restart the three minute clock? Uh, Mr. Mokorowski, go ahead. I just was gonna say, we do have a public hearing for um, <clears throat> uh, for order 2208-0907 that begins at 1.30. Uh, uh, so it's, um, it's up to you, Chair, if you want to take the public comment now on that item um, or or if the individual would like to come back. You know, the City of Eugene does not allow public comment on something that's going to be considered later on in the meeting. We are different. So I will, uh, Mr. Allen, I will say go ahead and provide comment commentary now. And we do have a public hearing at, uh, I believe it's at uh, 1.30 p.m., Mr. Mokrasi. Yeah. So you can comment now and then. Well, and well, we thank you. Yes. Good morning. Uh, my, as I said, my name is Michael Allen. I live in Florence. I'm, I'm here to, today to give you my personal perspective of why I believe a levy for the Lane County Parks is so important. I first came to Florence as a host at Harbor Vista Park with my wife, Pat, in 2014. While at Harbor Vista, I developed interpretive signs and programs and formed a friends group. Recognizing the value of education, we raised money for a sound system to support presentations at an amphitheater constructed by the park staff. Pat and I loved the interaction with the Florence community so much that we purchased a home not more than a 10 minute walk from the park. When the opportunity arose, I volunteered to be part of the master plan task force for two years. My emphasis was on ensuring the plan, including opportunities for educational experiences and the formation of friends groups for the parks throughout the uh, county. I was then approached by one of the members of the Parks Advisory Committee, Pat Bradshaw, who was retiring. He asked me to apply for his position. I was fortunate to be appointed to the commission by commissioner, uh, to that PAC by P Commissioner Farr to represent coastal interests. I have served on the PAC for almost two years. During that time, I have supported efforts to have Harbor Vista annexed into the city of Florence and have been an avid advocate for the North Jetty Park to become part of the Lane County Park System. Throughout all my time serving the community and its county parks, I have learned how important it is to have a reliable and consistent revenue source. Our parks need constant upkeep and we need to include more opportunities for outdoor education and recreation. I therefore highly encourage the Board of Commissioners to improve the levy for Lane County Parks. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Allen. And uh, once again, if you choose to uh, provide public testimony at uh, 1.30 today during the public hearing, you are welcome to do so. Ms. Jones, do we have anyone else signed up online? Thank you, Chair Farr. At this time, we I do not see any other hands raised, so I will return the meeting to you. Thank you. Uh, this concludes public testimony. Um, Mr. Mokraxel, we'll move down the agenda. Uh, the next item on the agenda is uh, commissioner's response and or uh, public comp and or remonstrances. Uh, I'll look at the board for a cue. You're in danger of me starting again. <laughs> well, then I will start. Um, uh, Mr. Allen will be discussing the uh, the parks. Uh, thank you for your work on the master plan, the parks master plan, and thank you for your ongoing work as a uh, member of the parks advisory committee. And uh, Mr. Riley, um, I believe the board of county commissioners did receive a uh, email from you this morning, uh, which uh, is available for people to read. It cannot be added into today's public record uh, It's too late to get it in today's public record, but it is a matter of public record because we did receive that email. Thank you for your testimony. Then I'm going to point out something that I've pointed out the last several weeks, and I want everybody to turn around and look out of the window. You got to do it. <laughs> that is the Lane County Farmers Market in its new home. All right. I will see that uh, opening more frequently um, as we get into the summer and, and as it, it, as it uh, gets its feet under it. But that is the permanent year-round home of the Lane County Farmers Market. 
Thank you for everyone who made that possible, Mr. Markaisi, and thank you for your leadership. Uh, several years ago, when we uh, when we did the land exchange that uh, allowed the city to take over that piece of property and uh, and ultimately uh, develop it into the farmers market. Pretty wonderful. Second thing I'm going to mention, unless somebody else is going to interrupt me, is that yesterday we had a pretty cool event. Uh, yesterday, Mr. Mokraisi, we uh, worked on uh, something that you had been working on for a long time. In fact, we all had. Um, it's the opening of the Navigation Center, a 75-bed facility designed for people who are uh, in urgent need of a, of a uh, safe place to sleep and urgent need in often, often uh, for physical health, uh, um, uh, physical health needs, sometimes behavioral health needs, 75-bed facility, and I believe that we'll begin using that facility, Mr. Mokraisi, as early as next week, is that correct? So if uh, uh, it's on, it's a former VA clinic on River Road, uh, River Avenue, excuse me, off River Road, it is currently in the district that I represent, soon to be in the district that the West Lane County Commissioner will represent. So with that, um, I'll ask the board any further comments. Then, uh, yes. Vice Chair Trigger. Thank yeah. you, Chair. I will just uh, amplify those comments and appreciation because we have several staff in the room today in particular uh, who were at the opening yesterday and or part of helping um, do some of the heavier lifting to get that site up and running for its initial intended purpose, which had been repurposed during COVID as respite, also critically important for our unhoused neighbors during the pandemic. But um, I was really pleased to tour and see how bright and welcoming and open of a space it is. Um, and I think for, uh, I can only speak for myself, but I imagine for others touring, it's hard not to walk through that space and imagine yourself needing to stay in a place like that and what it would feel like to come from what folks who will be staying there are coming from the conditions that they're currently living in and where they're going to be able to be somewhere where they can privately take a shower, where they can safely store their personal belongings, where they can have a good night's sleep, um, knowing that they and their items are secure. Um, it's just a, a remarkable and important program that we're, that we're launching. And clearly there is so much more need than that one facility uh, we'll be able to meet, but it's so important that we put as many of the puzzle pieces in place uh, as we can, even if they're, um, they're not quite adequate to meet the need, it, it all adds up. So very much appreciative of all our partners um, across the community, including City of Eugene and all of the staff that are here in the room today or um, and, and are not to, to make that happen. It was really just really great to see it, see it really, really coming to fruition. And I'm looking forward also to learning from a new provider that we're contracting with to provide services there. We've got some incredibly effective, um, reliable, good partners in the community delivering services to our unhoused neighbors, but it's really important that we expand that pipeline of providers and grow um, those partnerships. I'm really looking forward to learning from these folks who've been delivering these kind of services in other communities and, and how it works here. Um, the last thing I want to just comment, we've gotten lots of emails ongoing about our project at Lane Event Center and the potential for building a multi-purpose stadium uh, style facility. And just for anyone watching, I want to let folks know all of our meetings are available online. We've been discussing this project for many, many months, and um, the community engagement and outreach, uh, some neighborhood groups and others are doing that sort of on their own, but the county's official neighborhood engagement and outreach is uh, just to get underway. So folks will have lots of opportunity to share with us their concerns, ask their questions. Um, I do my best to respond to, to all the emails that come in since the facility um, the fairgrounds is in my uh, in my district, but I just want to assure folks that we are doing everything we can to engage and answer questions and be um, as transparent and share as much information as possible about the county's role and reasons that we're exploring uh, building such a facility. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you for that, Vice Chair. Uh, Commissioner Burning. Thank you, Chair. Um, Mr. Riley. I don't know a great deal about the issue, but as presented, and I didn't read the email this morning yet, but as presented, it does in my mind raise questions about um, about aspects of the county not being more user friendly. I'm, I can't even conceive of not being able to allow a child and a grandchild to park on my property and, <clears throat> and use it. I don't know, I would, um, Mr. Administrator, I would like to know more about how the county responds to these kinds of issues, whether there's a waiver that gives Mr. Riley more time 
according to my clock, August 10th is tomorrow. <laughs> um, and the reason that this struck a, a note for me is because I've also been receiving um, concerns that I forwarded to Public Works about a huge equestrian facility that's being built uh, in the floodplain of the Mackenzie River and a lot of animal waste is going to be going into the river. Um, and, uh, and I've seen the back and forth and the back and forth concerns me. So I just, I just, if I may follow through on that a bit and forgive me for my lack of information on that, but we need it. Um, Mr. Allen, thank you for your testimony on the levy. Um, and I also would like to comment on the navigation center. Um, this has been in the works a long time. It is absolutely a critical and missing link in this whole getting folks housing issue. And I wanna warn against a code that I came across in my campaign. That code is, code word is uh, wellness first housing earned. And if you oh. wanna think about what does that actually mean? What that means is only high barrier shelters for those in need until they've demonstrated whatever the criteria are to meet those high barriers. And only then have they earned the right to be sheltered. And for those of us on this body that believe that housing and shelter is a human right, um, that goes completely inconsistent with it. So when you hear that phrase, please understand what that means, because these will be issues that are coming up to this body. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you, Commissioner Burney. Uh, Commissioner Buck. Thank you, Chair. I just want to remind folks that we are in wildfire season. We do have a wildfire in Lane County. It's uh, called the Cedar Creek Fire. It is outside of Oak Ridge. It's uh, as of yesterday, it was about 3,200 acres and it continues to grow. And we see it in our foreseeable future uh, until there's any uh, modicum of rainfall. Uh, they do have fire watches up in the eastern area, and that is a challenge as thunderstorms can produce lightning that trigger fires in our region. I'm following it closely, <clears throat> and um, we do have cooperators meetings quite often. Um, I just want to make sure that the board is aware that we do have wildfires in our area, and I'm in touch with our emergency management um, staff often. Thank you, Commissioner Buck. It seems that uh, uh, East Lane County is kind of the hot spot for fires because of the nature of the Cascade Range, as opposed to the Coast Ranges, which do receive more moisture. Thank you. Commissioner mm -hmm. Wozovich. Thank you. Um, Mr. Riley, I, I, you know, that UGB donut, I've been dealing with that for years as part of my district. Um, and it's, it's a difficult place um, where we've got this intergovernmental agreement with the city to do in code enforcement and any new construction has to be per city code. Um, but existing stuff kind of falls in this, this strange gray area. Um, when we get to uh, board assignments, I'm gonna ask that we take another look at that IGA and make sure there is a process for appeals and variances um, in, in there for this particular issue. I am well aware of multiple hardship trailers without permits nearby my house. And I haven't reported a single one since the onset of COVID. Um, people just are desperate for housing. Um, and, you know, family member, and, and in one case, it was a recently divorced ex-wife that had to move back to her husband's property. <clears throat> he took a job in a restaurant right before COVID. You know, uh, so, <laughs> and it was my next door neighbor. Never reported it because it was just such a need for folks to have housing. Um, yes, so <laughs> I, we, we need to find a way to make that work for you. Um, and, and I hope we can do so. The UGB donut also has a tendency to disenfranchise a bunch of people where the city of Eugene makes decisions that are gonna impact their lives every day, like moving ahead, that's gonna possibly take lanes away from River Road and all those people in unincorporated River Road and Santa Clara didn't have a say, but they'll have to live with the congestion, which is already horrible 
our most congested and highest traffic accident intersection is River Road at Beltline, actually River Avenue, uh, and we and Silver Lane, that intersection right there. So we we need to have some way of making sure folks in the in that donut area stay represented and have an understanding of what's going on. Nobody knew what moving ahead meant. And it kind of breezed through the city of Eugene with LTD's push. And I don't think anyone understood it possibly meant taking a lane away on a road that is extremely congested. And I'm hoping maybe this board can take a look at that and maybe provide some comment on behalf of those disenfranchised folks in the donut. Thank you, Commissioner Bozovic. Um, any further comments or remonstrances? Then, Ms. Mokraisi, I have two more things to say. First off, um, regarding the, uh, the opening of the Navigation Center, I didn't know it, but yesterday was bring your child to a ribbon-cutting event day. It's <laughs> very little known, but um, I'm glad that you heard about it, Ms. Mokraisi, and you brought your uh, soon-to-be fifth-grade daughter, who really seemed to enjoy the the <laughs> week on yesterday. She had a great time. Yeah. She had a lot to say. She did. She always <laughs> does. You know. It was uh, a very enjoyable having a, a really, really good uh, group of people that were gathered. And uh, and it was, uh, Ms. Bud, it was good to see you there. You had a chance to really get a feel for how supportive the people of Lane County are and how, how great the partnerships are that uh, that you are a part of. So thank you for being there. Uh, the other thing I will say, Ms. Mogreisky, is that a, a telegraph, and it's along the lines of uh, what uh, Commissioner Bozovic just talked about, uh, during um, during uh, agenda requests, I'm going to ask you if there is anything that the county can do in terms of a discussion, an order, whatever it may be, regarding LTD's uh, LTD's plans to uh, uh, to move forward on five different corridors on moving ahead. There are five corridors on moving ahead. Uh, four of them are on city uh, city facilities. One of them, 30th Avenue, is a county road, but there's a no-build recommendation on, on the county road. On River Road, there's an EMX recommendation. And on the other three corridors, including, uh, uh, well, the other three corridors, including Highway 99, um, uh, there's a enhanced corridor. So uh, so I'll ask you during, remonstrant, during uh, our agenda team requests uh, later on this afternoon, if there is something that we can consider, what kind of action we can we can participate in, or, or if it's just a, a statement that the board can make, whatever it may be uh, regarding um, the moving forward moving forward uh, initiative by uh, pre predominantly by the city of Eugene and LTD. Okay, did I make that clear enough? That's that's a that's a telegraph. Yeah. It'll, it'll be a little clearer when I actually ask you. So. <laughs> Thank you. Any further uh, remonstrances? Then uh, we'll move forward with our agenda. At the sound of my gavel, I will be recessing the Board of Commissioners, <clears throat> and we will reconvene. Yes, Diana. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. We. Uh, I, I heard a voice from the clouds, <laughs> and sometimes that is uh, Ms. Jones telling me that I'm doing something not quite right. Always. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm going moving, doing things quite right right now. When I say the sound of my gavel, we will recess the Board of County Commissioners and we'll reconvene in a joint meeting of the Board of Health and the Board of County Commissioners. Um, Mr. Mokraheiski, I'll take a moment to introduce your panel. Uh, today we have uh, Dr. Jocelyn Warren and Director Eve Gray. And uh, I'll turn it over to you, Ms. Gray. I will turn it over to Dr. Warren to do the presentation. Very good, thank you. Thank you, Chair Farr and Commissioners. I am here today to give you our um, monthly now COVID update and um, present some of our plans for the future um, as we continue to respond to COVID in our community. Let me make sure I can get the presentation up here. There we go. I'm going to begin with um, our case status. This week, you may have noticed that Lane County is at the medium community COVID level. This is um, 
um, something that's closely watched by members of our community as well, the CDC levels. Um, it does appear that cases are leveling off, as you can see with the caveat that, of course, these cases represent only lab confirmed cases. So we, um, this does not include um, home tests or other tests that we are not made aware of that are not reported the Lane County Public Health. Our weekly case rate per 100,000 population is 194.47, which it's been hovering between 190 and a little over 200 um, cases per 100,000 for the last several weeks. And that sometimes tips us into the red level for the CDC community because that 200 is a, a cutoff point. So that's just to know that that's accounts for some of the, the bouncing around that we're seeing. Um, we're getting fewer home tests reported. In fact, last week we had um, just 64 cases reported, which was the lowest weekly total um, since July. hospitalization and death. Um, in the last 30 days, 128 people have been in the hospital with positive COVID tests. This is the kind of with versus for conundrum. Um, we don't know exactly how many of these folks were admitted because of COVID, um, but they do test positive with COVID once they are there. And that's not to say that those tests are not relevant. COVID absolutely can um, complicate existing conditions and land someone in the hospital who may not otherwise um, have been there. But it is interesting to know that um, in Massachusetts, where they've been tracking um, with COVID as opposed to for COVID uh, since January of 2022, 30% of of those with COVID are for COVID. So only 30% of those people who um, are there with COVID and tested are actually in the hospital because of COVID related um, symptoms. And, and that's also that number's been steadily declining. And those hospitalized continue to be older and mostly un or under vaccinated. Moving now to our vaccination rates. This number will look a little bit different from the number that um, I presented previously, and that's because those six months and older are now eligible for a vaccination. So rates are now calculated for the whole population rather than those 18 and older. When it was 18 and older, our last reported rate was 80.5 of the population for at least one dose. Now we are at 73.4% for at least one dose. And as you can see, those um, lower age groups are those with the, the lowest rates of vaccination. There's a little more information about vaccination rates by age. That's very small. I apologize for the size of the font. This is also available um, on the Oregon Health Authority website. Um, you can see that one dose for 65 and older is at 93.6%, which is a very good, very good number. However, um, those that have a um, booster dose as well, who are considered up to date, then really dro drops to 72%, even among those um, 65 years and older. So that would be considered our highest risk um, age group for sure. So we still have a lot to do to bring people up to date uh, on vaccinations. <laughs> So I'm going to talk a little bit about vaccination access. Um, we have been partnering with the Oregon Health Authority at our Valley River Center Clinic on Thursdays through Sundays. That um, provides all ages um, for vaccination, as well as all vaccines, including the, the Novavax vaccine. We continue to hold community clinics in Springfield and Eugene and partner with community-based organizations for clinics. Um, one we have coming up, for example, is a partnership with Nurturely for um, a pediatric-focused clinic specifically. I'm gonna talk a little bit about boosters. So um, 
boosters restore the protection that may have waned since your initial vaccination. So staying up to date really protects from severe illness and death. Um, for the eligibility, one booster, everyone who is five years or older, um, the CDC recommends to get at least um, one shot five months since the primary vaccination series, or at least three months if um, the person is immunocompromised. The second booster shot is recommended for those age 50 and older and anyone 12 years or older if immunocompromised, at least four months since they received their first booster. Now what's coming? So there's been a lot of conversation, of course, in the news about what's coming in the fall. Um, a lot of discussion about what is the best approach. We expect as far as we can, um, a resurgence of COVID in the fall, simply because coronaviruses typically um, prefer that type of weather and are able to circulate um, more easily. We also expect that some people's immunity are, is waning as we see from the lower percentages um, of people that are fully vaccinated. So the intent and the, the hope is to really um, increase people's immunity going into the fall. There's been some discussion about whether it's more important to broaden protection and start um, providing booster doses to uh, of what we currently have for everyone more broadly and try to put a, put a big push that way or make it more um, flu-like approach and create new boosters that include the, um, the Omicron variant. And that side of the argument has won out. So the, um, the, the companies that make our, our vaccinations, not Novavax, but um, Pfizer, um, uh, and Moderna have been uh, directed to create new boosters for the fall that will include the Omicron variant as well. So it's really um, a half and half vaccine. It has also the original native variant um, of the coronavirus, SARS-CoV-2, um, as well as the Omicron variant. It's a uh, whether that's the right approach, I don't think we actually know at this point. Um, presumably at that point, those under the age of 50 will also be um, approved for the second booster shots. Let's see, uh, the, um, let me see, there's more to say on that. Um, well, I can answer any questions that you might have as far as I know. We are certainly um, anticipating the, the release of those bivalent boosters. That's I would hope <laughs> create a great deal of um, of uh, desire and hope for those in, in our community. We're hoping that there will be demand. Um, we do not at this point um, for public health have um, the capacity or, or planning to do the, the mass vaccination clinics. This will really become something that becomes normalized within provider practices and within pharmacies as we have, um, as we continue to see that, that process happen. We will continue to focus on areas where we find gaps. And as we can see from the earlier um, data, the gaps really now are in pediatric um, vaccines. So that has been our primary, our primary focus and something that we will continue to focus on. We do have um, another Valley River Center clinic um, planned uh, that is coming up on the 19th and the 20th. And that is actually making pediatric vaccines available across a broad spectrum. So we will have um, polio, hepatitis B, MMR, DTAP, Tdap um, available um, by appointment um, to this pediatric clinic. That will be um, with our staff just a special two-day. We are also partnering with our um, coordinated care organizations and Kaiser Permanente to help get the word out about those um, about this clinic and to um, provide um, additional media support so families and parents are aware that this is available to them in advance of their um, kids returning to school. We're also working on, um, together with uh, Eve and Health and Human Services in discussion with um, working on um, implementing a longer term Valley River Center clinic to um, provide COVID vaccinations, but also this other wider range of pediatric vaccines. Um, we are low in some, especially the two year old age group, um, the in, in, across a range of vaccines. Um, 
the 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 school age is not as uh, is not as acute the the gap. So we really are working with the the pediatric age group is most important. I think that zero to two. Um, what we're hoping to do is um, have a a clinic that's available at Valley River Center for um, throughout the fall and into the early winter as kids do return to school. And we know that there are, for example. One of the gaps that we're seeing that we're hearing in our WIC program, particularly as new arrivals to our area are unable to find a, a pediatrician um, once they get here necessarily. It can be a process and take some time. So in the meantime, um, those are the families, particularly and others who have barriers to access that we're really um, hoping to support in providing um, a greater range uh, of vaccines and increase our overall uh, community immunity as we head into the fall which actually should be very helpful also with um, responding to COVID. So that is my presentation. Thank you, Chair Farr. Yeah, I you, think Dr. The, the one thing that I might add to that is just um, really emphasizing the importance of pediatric vaccination of all kinds. We have seen measles outbreaks. Um, we had a polio case recently in the United States. Um, and these are preventable illnesses. Our, our children throughout COVID became um, under vaccinated significantly more than prior to COVID. So we are not just focusing on COVID vaccination now, but the broader range of vaccines, as Dr. Warren pointed out, really, really important to prevent some of these diseases that had been all but eradicated uh, from our nation. <clears throat> Thank you, Dr. Gray. <clears throat> Excuse me, Dr. Gray, and thank you, Dr. Warren. And I'll open it for questions to the board. But first, uh, just a clarification: uh, the uh, August nineteenth and twentieth clinic for pediatrics is for all vaccinations, including polio and including uh, uh, the other childhood vaccinations, um, and it's by appointment only. Mm -hmm. uh, will it be easy for people to set that appointment? Is that something that will be done online on the county website? At this point right now, it's by phone call, but we will have an online registration. We're working on that. Um, but the phone number, if folks are interested, it's 541-682-4041. And that number is available on the website as well. Is it clearly bannered on the website that that's the number? Because yes. Quite often, there are so many things on our website. You know, sometimes it's a little bit difficult to navigate to exactly what it is you're looking for. So. Absolutely, but I would think that any number that somebody would call um, at Public Health, they can get them also Perfect. to the right place. So that won't be a problem. And I do have a couple of further questions, unless other board members ask them first. So I'll turn it over to the board for questions or comments. Looking to the left and right, you're in danger of me asking my questions. Then, Commissioner Bernie. I've, I've rescued us from that danger. <laughs> um, when you mentioned uh, that these are only lab confirmed cases, to me that suggests that there's as much that we don't know as that we do know. So only lab, and I can't exactly see the, the slides. So I'm not asking you to bring them back up, but only you mentioned something about only lab confirmed cases still put us at how many per hundred? It's, it hovers around between 190 and 210 and, um, cases per week per 100,000 population. Right. And that's a, that, that's a danger level, is it not? Mm -hmm. That is absolutely community-wide circulation, yes. And that does not include home tests. It include that that number that does not, not include reported. home tests. That's correct. So one would assume, with even a small modicum of home tests, there's significant community spread occurring in Lane County. Um, how does how do I, if I test positive for COVID at home, report that? Because I have no idea how to do that, and therefore those numbers aren't being rolled into anything. Um, yes, Commissioner Bernie, you can report that test to us at Lane County Public Health. There is an online form to do that. You could also call that same 4041 number that I mentioned. We do not include that number in our um, reporting because we want to be very clear that if we were to include, to be clear that this, these are the lab confirmed tests, then that number is also um, comparable to what you will see from the CDC or from the Oregon Health Authority. Um, and if we were to include home tests in that number, it could just maybe imply that that is somehow 
a sum total number. I mean, we know that it's not, but we do track the number of home tests. The value of calling, of course, and wait, letting wait, us- I'm sorry. I'm sorry. We do track the number of home tests only if someone calls a number yes. they might not know or fills out a form they might not know about. That's correct, sir. So we're, we really don't. And I don't say I would say that the tracking piece is not really the important part of re of reporting, because we don't have a complete picture and we really don't have a way to do that. Um, it is an opportunity for us to connect people with whatever services they may require or other supports for COVID. So that's a chance also for us to have a conversation with people when they do call. So that's probably the the, the higher value um, of that reporting. No, thank you. I'm not being critical. I'm just trying to fill in gaps. Um, it might be difficult, and if so, just tell me, but I would really appreciate also graphs that chart out not just age groups, but age groups by number of doses that they've had. So, because at this point, and maybe you do know, and maybe I missed it, I'd like to know that how many people have only had one shot versus those like myself that are over 65 that have immunocompromised conditions that have had two boosters. Um, does that, that, I think that also speaks to the resilience that we've established for the community. So if that's possible, I would like that in your next report. Um, and I would also like to just um, encourage uh, staff whenever they can for a few weeks. I know Mr. Rickoff has been trying to get uh, a meeting with a group called Escudo Latino. Um, and let me just mention for the board's sake why. Uh, there are a couple of leaders of that, um, Mariello Escudo, Mariella Escudo and Rosie Hernandez, excuse me, Rosie Tadeo. Um, and in Springfield, we're, the Springfield public schools, over a third of their entire population is minority. And especially with the native Spanish speaking population in our community, there's a hesitance to really um, be confident, um, to even admit things to government official sources. And this to me is just one example of how we can leverage, we keep talking equity, um, which is great. And I know on a staff level, you keep pursuing it in all that you do. That's why I think we call it a, a lens as opposed to a program, but nonetheless, um, with that lens, there are groups that have an infrastructure and are organized and have outreach in place. The county doesn't need to spend any dollars for that. They have credibility with their com underserved communities. And so the reason that I've asked for a meeting um, uh, with Ms. Gray and, and others that Mr. Rickoff has been trying to get for several weeks now is because I think this could create a template for the kind of another way of reaching out and creating partnerships, which historically this county has not done. Um, and COVID is such a good reason to, to initiate those kinds of things. So um, I just really wanna underscore why I've been requesting that. Um, I also would like to speak briefly. You mentioned pediatricians. It's my last point, Chair, I'm sorry. You mentioned, pe the danger is me talking, not you. <laughs> um, Ms. Gray was also kind enough to meet with one of the only two pediatric practices in Springfield. And I just wanna share that that practice was and is going out of business. And the reason it's going out of business is because with the advent of COVID, a disproportionate share of their patients are coming from families that are now on Medicaid. And Medicaid doesn't bill at the same rates as insured patients. And once the percentages get to a certain tipping point, for Medicaid, and the reason for that is people were out of work, people women had to, people had to take care of their children, they had to stay at home. Um, once that billing gets out of whack, you're out of business. And so in addition to the need for young people when they come into our county or who are in our county to receive that, that vaccination, <clears throat> we also have the double whammy of having pediatricians um, going out of business. So I just wanted to point that out and. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Commissioner Bernie. Any further comments or questions? Commissioner Bozovich, followed by Vice Chair Trigger. Thank you. So um, having my wife and I both had COVID recently um, and determined by a home test, it's amazing when you got a bad case, how quickly that C colors up. 
Didn't have to wait 15 minutes to know I was positive. I was, took about two. <laughs> yeah. Um, there is right on all the home test boxes is a QR code. And it takes you to a link to download an app to report to the CDC your positive test. Um, so that's the easy way to do it for most people that have a have a smartphone. What's a QR code? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We'll tell you later, Beth Boomer. Um, <laughs> I always joke with him. Yeah. I, I, third oldest on the board. <laughs> so uh, uh, that's the easy way to report. So kind of one of my questions is, I, I reported both my wife and my case to the CDC. Is that part of that total of home test reports that you kind of are not reporting, or is that part of what you report as a, a lab confirmed? Commissioner Bozovich, we don't get information from the CDC about home reported tests. So uh, what they provide on their website are also lab confirmed. Okay, so I, I'm just kind of interesting because it seemed to me that that was there ought to be some way where it comes back down to the county level if the, if they're if they're having us if the tests are telling you this is the way to report. You know, I didn't know there was a separate way to report. Um, so you wouldn't have been counted. I guess not. You know, those two cases weren't counted in the numbers, which, and, and there's more than people that are, you know, oh, I'm not, you know, one, you're sick, you're not feeling good, you don't want to go through the process of reporting your case. And some people are worried if they do report the case, somehow or another, they'll be confined and, and, and who knows what else. So they don't. So there's more non reporting. Um, and those home tests are more likely to fail to the negative, where you get a false negative than a false positive. They're very accurate on the positives. So uh, people, at, and that's usually operator error in the false negatives. Um, that all said, wife and I both were fully boosted, um, picked it up traveling, uh, but were masked on almost all of our travels because they required it um, as part of uh, the cruise we were on, small ship cruise, so it's very small number of people. It appears that, uh, you know, the BA four and five are an airborne virus to me. Um, you know, our real concern at first in the masking seemed to be all about um, droplet prevention. So as I'm sitting here looking at people in surgical masks, which do not stop the breath from getting around it. And I know I can't keep my glasses from fogging even with a KN95 because my nose is a little bit unusually sized. Um, and I, you know, and I almost had to giggle. Uh, we had a staffer in here that has a very prodigious beard giving a report wearing a KN95 over this beard. You know, and, 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 and how effective is masking against these new variants? It seems to me that um, we're giving people a false sense of security because most, and particularly cloth masks, uh, you know, are, are pretty, have been proven almost non-effective, uh, face shields, non-effective. And we're, you know, we're having people wearing surgical masks, which are not, if you're talking about an airborne, they're not meant for that. They're really meant to prevent droplet, you know, uh, projection. And even a KN95, if it doesn't fit properly, doesn't stop around, leak around. Uh, so I'm kind of, it, are, are we, are we giving people some kind of, you know, placebo effect or something by asking them to wear a mask, you know, or, or, you know, cause I've, I've also seen studies that basically show that they're less than, you know, two to 1% effective. And it's mostly for the folks that are wearing good, well-fitted masks. So, you know, how, how do, how do we deal with that? Commissioner Bozovich, I yeah, absolutely agree. There's certainly a range of effectiveness when it comes to masks. Um, we do know that fitting is important. Um, we see that in hospitals, of course. That's why masks are used regularly in, in areas where um, infection control is important. Um, the, the And we know... I hope that we've communicated that there are certain masks that are less effective, like cloth masks. We have certainly learned quite a lot during the duration of this pandemic. 
I don't think anybody should rely on masking alone. Um, absolutely, vaccination is our first line of protection. Masking is important, but I think also we're seeing the importance of ventilation. Um, there's been a resurgence, of course, of interest in how do we improve ventilation in um, um, our buildings, especially in places where we have congregate living or vulnerable people, long-term care facilities, schools. I think that will continue, that research will continue because COVID appears to be here to stay. So we are going to have to learn how to live with it. And we're going to need a range of, of things to be able to try to control the spread. Um, I think ventilation, masking, um, distancing, distancing is still very important. Um, if it's aerosolized, of course, then there are other complications with that. So I, I think we're still, at, we're learning a lot and we're still learning how to adapt and there's a lot of research that continues. So we'll we'll have to be um, kind of just keep up with that and have, have our recommendations match the latest science, which has always been our goal. Great. I'm happy to speak to the reason that I choose to mask still in most settings. Um, and for me personally, uh, it's because I really like not getting sick, not just COVID, but I have found that since I started wearing a mask frequently, um, even having kids in my house, I get sick less frequently. That's something that is an outcome of mask wearing that I enjoy and appreciate. I also happen to be going on a cruise in two weeks. Um, those who know me know that. And if I test positive for COVID-19, I don't get to go on my cruise. So I am hoping that there will be some, even if it's not perfect, which of course it's not perfect. We've known that for ages in healthcare, masks are not perfect, but we continue to wear them in settings that are higher risk because it decreases our risk. And, um, and I am hopeful that I will not test positive so that I can go enjoy my vacation. So <laughs> those are the reasons that I am choosing to wear a mask. and. And at this point it is, it's a personal choice. It, it's um, for folks who, uh, for whatever their reason, um, want to have some additional level of protection, but you are right, it is not a panacea. Thank you, I appreciate that. And I do you know, appreciate that people should allow for their free choice. And, and I, you know, if somebody is wearing a mask and wants me to wear a mask around them, I'll put a mask on. Um, and if you notice, I kind of scooch my chair over at the beginning of the meeting because separation is one of the things um, and all that. So, um, yeah, I just, you know, it just sometimes surprises me when I do see people, you know, the mask is down only over their mouth, you know, they've got a full beard, you know, <laughs> it's, it's like, yeah, if you, firemen, you generally don't have beards. There's a reason, <laughs> you know, because uh, those smoke masks don't really work if you have a beard. Um, so I just, I hope folks understand that. And it really is more about the forward projection of aerosols than it is about, you know, actually stopping an airborne virus and good ventilation distance, good hand hygiene. Uh, uh, so much of that's helping people keep from being sick. Um, and, and that I've noticed I've had less colds during all this, but also been in a lot less meetings and shaking a lot less hands. Thank you, Commissioner. Vice Chair Trigger. Thank you, Chair. Thank you for the presentation. That's all a great segue. I, I will say, if this is helpful to take it out of the realm of COVID and masking for a minute, someone explained to me, this was going on more than a year ago now, it's sort of like the difference between, do you have a window wide open without a screen? Do you have a screen in the window? How big are the grids in that screen? Has to do with how many bugs get in the room. Um, so, you know, that's, that was just a, took it completely out of all whatever feelings or opinions or information people may or may not have about COVID. That just made a lot of sense to me. So um, wearing a mask is like having a screen in your window versus a wide open window with nothing in it. Um, and I also want to really appreciate there are people out there wearing masks because they've tested positive and they've completed their isolation and quarantine and they're doing right on their part. It's not only about contracting, but about transmitting. And again, not perfect, but I appreciate it. But really, the top line, what I'm hearing from you and, and that I just want to sort of bring home is vaccines are the best, um, is our best tool. And um, to continue with distancing, to continue hosting events outdoors as much as possible um, as we have the weather on our side for that, 
Um, I also appreciate not not as much handshaking. I'm I'm a new found fan and adopter of the elbow, uh, because I think it is important as humans to have an acknowledgement, make some eye contact, and have some way of greeting each other, and making some kind of contact. But there's all kinds of reasons that handshaking doesn't work for all kinds of people. Um, so I'm appreciating all the new creative ways people are finding to to greet and connect with one another as we're as we are having more meetings. And um, so just really want to emphasize my appreciation for everything public health is doing. We can get kind of hung up on the on the data and the numbers. It's important because um, public health is a science practice, and so we do want the data. But the fact that we have um, the numbers we have based on laboratory confirmed tests, um, arguing over how much higher that would be with the home tests, is um, is less the point for me than showing that if that's what we know based on laboratory testing alone, we clearly are not out of this and need to do everything we can. And the best frontline defense is the vaccines. And then second, all these other things that we've been talking about for two years now, hand washing, distancing, good ventilation, and masking. So thank you so much for the update. <clears throat> Keep up the good work. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Chair. Commissioner Buck. I'll only add that I wear masks as well for wildfire smoke. <laughs> I'm kind of in that realm uh, this time of year, but um, I appreciate the report very much. It's interesting to note that we continue to be at really high levels and they're not going away. It is just consistent. And hopefully that um, we can keep our numbers down in the hospital. It doesn't mean people aren't still getting sick, but maybe just not as significantly ill as what they were before. Um, I'm interested in seeing how the fall boosters or whatever we're gonna call it then, like our flu shots are gonna come out for both adults and children um, when they get back in schools where not all ventilation systems have been improved by then, that's going to take a long time to get them up, uh, replaced, and in, in, in a state where our kiddos are in a safe, healthy environment. We have some pretty old schools out there with some old systems. And um, financing and installing and renovating those are going are to take some time. Thank you, Chair. And thank, thank you, Commissioner Buck. Then a couple of questions that did not get asked by other board members. Um, I'm going to say this out loud. I've not said it out. I'm over 50. Okay. <laughs> I think Commissioner Bozo has just alluded to that. But um, let's say uh, somebody over 50, uh, you talk about eligibility for a second booster. So if somebody over 50, do they need to prove that they're over 50 before they get the second booster? Or does the vaccination card give them that? Is that listed on their vaccination card? Chair Farr, we have a statewide database called Alert that tracks vaccinations, and it does include things like date of birth um, in the record. So that would be known to the provider. So if someone were to go to the Valley River Center, uh, as opposed to choosing their own primary care physician <clears throat> or uh, pharmacy, <clears throat> excuse me, they'd, uh, they wouldn't necessarily need to take anything other than ID with them, that they didn't need to take their vaccination card with them. It's helpful to have that information, but it's not necessary. There are um, forms that um, people fill out with that information, and that information then is entered into the databases yeah. and compared with the existing data that we already have. So if someone loses their vaccination card, it can be replicated through a system that's already in place, and they can uh, kind of get that through the county, or do they need to go to the P primary care physician? We send people actually to the state um, for that information. Uh, you can also, though, get it from your provider. If you have access to a provider, your provider can also replicate that information from the alert database. Excellent. Now, in Oregon, an electronic vaccine card is available. So you um, folks can go to the state system and get that downloaded onto their phone so that you don't have to carry around a paper copy. And is that through OHA's website? It is, and we do have a link to that on our website as well. It can be a little wonky. Some people have a little trouble with that, so I'm hesitant to you know, kind of recommend it with full enthusiasm. But I was able to do it, but I have heard from other people that had some, some issues on being able to download it appropriately. Mm -hmm. Okay. Then, uh, okay, uh, we'll receive those questions as we move forward into the fall. Particularly, you said that Moderna and Pfizer, it won't be the until the fall before the, the upgraded, so to speak, vaccine will be will be available. That's correct. We don't have a date for when those vaccines will be available, but that information will be coming out in the next, you know, several weeks, I'm sure. But for those of us with children or grandchildren at home, uh, August 18th and 19th are key days for vaccination uh, at about 
the day uh, Chair Fart, 19th and 20th. Yes, thank you. Me. Thank you. <laughs> and we test. will continue to publicize uh, as we have more information about dates and times. We have identified funding uh, for the Valley River Center Clinic through the fall. So uh, really trying to continue that push and uh, to support our community to rebound in those vaccination rates. Very good. And then just one item of, of clarity regarding the reporting, the data on the number of uh, uh, positive cases. While we know it's not the number of positive cases that are actually around, it is consistent with the reporting that occurs by the CDC and other agencies. So we have, we're operating on the same playing field, so to speak. Um, and the unreported cases are an unknown at, at all levels. It's kind of like the point in time count. And we know we're not accurate in the point in time count, but we know we're reporting the same way other people are reporting it. Very good. Anything further, uh, Director Gray, Dr. Warren, thank you so much for this presentation this morning, and we'll see you again. I'm sorry, I should look more peripherally. Uh, Commissioner Bernie. Thank you, and I'm sorry. Um, an electronic thing that's worked for us is we take a picture of our card, and <laughs> it's accepted everywhere we go. <laughs> um, I did also wanted to say that I've tried to change the data on the state system. I've now reached a point where I'm embarrassed when people ask for my birth date. It's like, you could be my grandkid. Um, <laughs> I'd like to make one comment though, because it's important to me. Normally I would agree with the commissioner that said that, you know, it just gives you a feel that the numbers for where you are. But the reason I brought that up is we were told in passing that we're at sort of a critical dangerous level of community spread based upon the numbers we do have. When we're that close to me, then it does become important to take a look at the margins and see what impact that would have one way or the other. And it's very clear that what that means is that not only are we not out of it, but we're solidly in it. Is that correct? Commissioner Bernie, I would say yes, we have widespread community transmission in Lane County. Thank you. I just wanted to clarify that one point. Thank you, Chair, for allowing me to comment. And um, thank you. Uh Commissioner Burning, there's my photograph of my vaccination card. There you go. That's the, there, I'm seeing multiple <laughs> as an alternative, right, to what was discussed. <laughs> Once again, thank you for a, a wonderful presentation, and we'll see you in uh, however many weeks. I think it's uh, four weeks before we see you again. Very good. Yep. Unless there's need to. <laughs> Let's not have any more. <laughs> okay. <laughs> thank you. Then at this point, uh, commissioners, at the sound of my gavel, we will uh, adjourn the joint meeting of the Board of Health and the Board of County Commissioners and reconvene as the Board of County Commissioners. And now, Mr. Mokar, we, we have before us our uh, consent calendar. Um, all items on the consent calendar will be passed in a single motion. Any items that uh, board members or staff would have liked pulled from the consent calendar would have been done so already. This will be, uh, the consent calendar will be adopted by a single vote. Anything on the consent calendar can be viewed in its entirety. If you go to our website, go to the uh, today's agenda and click view items and it will show you everything that the Board of County Commissioners has considered before passing this consent calendar. With that, do I have a motion? Vice Chair Trigger. Chair, I'll move uh, approval of the consent calendar for Tuesday, August 9th, 2022. I'll second. Moved by Vice Chair Trigger and seconded by Commissioner Buck. Discussion to the motion. Seeing no discussion, I will call for the vote. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Passes unanimously. Then we'll move along down the agenda to item seven, uh, which is, uh, excuse me, item six, which is, no, six is a consent calendar. No. That's right. I think we had a little numbering change. I don't know when you loaded, but then that's there, so we're on health and human services. Seven. <laughs> it's oh, it's just a number and change. Thank you. Yeah. So we are at Health and Human Services, and we have a discussion, a status update on progress with unhoused populations. And today, Ms. Mokrajski, we have a wonderful panel and a wonderful presentation. I'll turn it over to you for introductions. Thank you, Chair. We do have a wonderful panel, and um, several of you commented on the opening of the Shelter Navigation Center yesterday that we're really thrilled uh, to have done. I know uh, Kate and James will talk more about that. We also had um, several of us who were able to be at the opening of the NEL last week. So we've, um, this is this is uh, ribbon cutting season and we're really pleased that we've had the opportunity to celebrate a number of 
long-term investments and continue to make progress on adding to our stock of permanent supportive housing. And of course, the gap that we've long had here and not having a low barrier public shelter and navigation center. So uh, pleased to have, of course, Eve Gray, our Health and Human Services Director, Kate Budd, um, our uh, Program Manager in Human Services, and James Yule is our Coordinated Entry Supervisor. So I'll turn it over, I think, to, to Kate and James to walk through the presentation. Ms. Real, it's good to see you in person. Likewise, likewise. So yes, thank you, commissioners. Thanks for the opportunity to, to present to you today. Um, so I'm gonna be talking about some of the coordinated entry improvements that we started undertaking really um, when I started with the county about a year and a half ago, as well as some goals we have for the next year moving forward with coordinated entry. Um, and it's kind of split into some areas. So it's work that's been done by the coordinated entry stakeholder committee, which is a subcommittee of the poverty and homelessness board, as well as work we've done with league, the lived experience committee. Um, um, as well as some strategic changes we've made to our coordinated entry outreach team, which is a Lane County staffed um, outreach team that works with households that are on the centralized wait list. So I wanna start by defining some terms and I recognize you all are probably familiar with a lot of the things that we're gonna be talking about, but I would just wanna make sure for, for those listening at home that we're sharing um, those terms. Jeez. Whoops. It's like being at a concert, like there's the player, but you could really get a good view on the screen. <laughs> Show us and we're all looking over there. <laughs> kind of like, you know, showing the crowd in the football stadium and everybody's looking up at this at the, the screen jumbotron. for the, the jumbotron for the replay. Yeah, the see who's down there. <laughs> the stands. Yeah. <laughs> yep. So defining some terms. So, um, you know, coordinated entry is a, is a HUD required process for um, COCs across the country. So it's not something that is um, unique to Lane County. It is a requirement of, of HUD. Um, and HUD really defines some, some key kind of effective qualities of coordinated entry. Um, one being prioritization. So really recognizing that um, the resources we have available for folks experiencing homelessness in our community um, are, are not adequate to cover the need. And so we really need to prioritize those households that are most vulnerable vulnerable and ensure they're being connected to those housing resources as quickly as possible. Um, additionally, HUD really emphasizes a housing first approach and a low barrier approach. So connecting households to housing without a requirement of mental health treatment or substance abuse, abuse treatment um, or even case management. It's really let's get these households housed and then we can start to work on some of those more um, in-depth things. Um, Coordinated entry really also should be person-centered. So prior to coordinated entry, it really relied on the project um, and the providers to determine who they were gonna enroll in their programs. Um, and that often led to the highest acuity folks, the folks with the most need, not necessarily ever getting enrolled in those programs because they were the hardest to reach. Um, and so through coordinated entry, it really emphasizes the, the person and the, the individual experiencing homelessness and ensures that they're getting connected to the appropriate resource. Um, along with that, there's a standardized process to coordinated entry. So it's a requirement that we have a standardized assessment tool and that we have fair and equal access for all households looking to access coordinated entry. And that's really countywide. It's across the geographic coverage of Lane County. And then additionally, there's a set um, referral protocols that, that, that are used when um, referring households to providers for housing. And I'm going to get into more of those details a little bit later. Um, I do think this graphic really does a good job of kind of showing um, what a system or, or without a coordinated entry system, what it looks like and then what it looks like with. So without coordinated entry, a household's experiencing homelessness and they really don't know where to go. They end up contacting 10, 15 different providers. They go on the Internet. They Google homeless resources in Lane County, you know, I get calls, I'm sure you all get calls and emails from folks, they just don't know where to go. So it's often a maze where they're kind of bouncing around going from one place to the next. So with coordinated entry, the goal really is having that consistent access point where folks know where to go um, to receive that assistance, um, and then quickly um, to have their homelessness resolved um, and, and end up moving into permanent housing. 
So the benefits of coordinated entry really are, are threefold. It's for the, the, obviously the individuals themselves experiencing homelessness, but it's also for the providers in our community as well as, as the larger community as a whole. Um, so for those folks, folks experiencing homelessness, and I talked about this previously, having that single entry point for accessing housing services and not having to go individually contact every single provider across the county. Um, you know, there's, there's key sites that they can go um, to access coordinated entry. And then additionally, they're really being matched based on their service needs. So through that assessment tool, which I'll talk about more later as well, we're able to identify what barriers they may have um, and what specific service needs they have, and we can get them connected to the, the program type that's going to best serve them. And then there's consistency in both paperwork and assessment. So rather than, you know, every provider doing a different assessment, having a different intake through coordinated entry, there's one assessment, one intake that's good for referral to all of the providers that um, receive referrals through coordinated entry. And for service providers, it really, you know, it ensures that, you know, they no longer need to screen for eligibility when they decide to enroll someone in their program because they are be being provided a referral from coordinated entry where um, Lane County has already determined, determined eligibility. So they, they know that that person is going to be eligible for their program. It also reduces their need to maintain an internal wait list, which, um, you know, with the numbers that we see of unhoused folks in our communities, those wait lists can get quite long and managing them can be um, incredibly time consuming. And then additionally, the referral process is handled solely by Lane County staff, um, HMIS staff. And so the provider no, you know, doesn't have to, to do that legwork to, to get referrals for their program. And again, household needs are identified immediately upon referral. So providers no longer need to do their own assessment to determine what the household needs are um, based on that coordinated entry assessment. When they're referred, those have been identified. And then for the larger community as a whole, again, it just really um, ensures that the most vulnerable neighbor, neighbors in our county are being prioritized for that assistance. Um, and it's really a collaborative approach. So, um, you know, moving away from, from the provider network kind of working in silos through coordinated entry, um, the county is partnering with providers and we're, we're all working on this together. Um, I'm going to talk more about case conferencing, but that's one of the ways that we really um, are able to create a partnership with the providers in our community. And then it really um, makes for very clear data. I know you all have, have uh, our colleague, our previous colleague, Lisa Stewart, has, has done a great job um, presenting to you all about data in the past. With coordinated entry in particular, we get to, a picture is painted on what the households experiencing homelessness in our community are experiencing, um, you know, mental health, substance abuse, um, families, veterans. We get a really clear data picture um, of what those needs are uh, in our community. I want to make sure to make a distinction um, between the homeless by name list, which is also referred to as the HBNL, and then the centralized wait list, which is the CWL. Um, the HBNL is the larger number of um, households that identify being homeless at a service provider that enters information into HMIS. Um, so this number is generally um, considered to be a pretty accurate reflection of the total number of households in our county experiencing homelessness at any given time. Um, so these numbers are from the last fiscal year. So in the last fiscal year, there were 8,492 households that experienced homelessness throughout that year um, and accessed a, an HMIS uh, program. The CWL is obviously a smaller subset of the HBNL and the CWL are those households um, that have engaged in coordinated entry. So they've they've gone to a front door site and they have done the front door assessment and are now on the centralized waiting list awaiting for referral. So obviously you will see this is a small fraction of the larger uh, homeless by name list. And I, and I think there's a few reasons for that. I think one is that we really need to increase how we advertise coordinated entry. Uh, it needs to be a process that is well known to everyone in our community. Um, I think there are households that just don't know about it, um, and so they don't know to access it. Along with that, the households that do know, I think we there's a lot of work we can do to increase access to coordinated entry, which I'll talk about later as well. But, you know, right now we have what are called front door sites where we direct folks to go to um, five different providers kind of spread across the county um, to get their front door assessment done. And obviously there's barriers to that. There's transportation barriers. Sometimes there's intimidation. You know, a household has never accessed services from a certain provider and they, they may not feel comfortable going to that provider. And frankly, sharing really personal information 
with them on, the, on this assessment. So I think there's a lot of work we can do to try to get a higher percentage of our total number of households experiencing homelessness engaged with, uh, with coordinated entry. So this slide talks about the current uh, prioritization that we use for coordinated entry. And I say current because through the work of the stakeholder committee um, and other community stakeholders, we're really uh, looking to take a look at our prioritization criteria and, and see if it's a, a criteria that is currently addressing the needs that we have in our county. Um, so currently the prioritization is based on the score they get on the VI SPDAD. So that's the Vulnerability Index Service Prioritization Determinant Assistance Tool, which is a mouthful. Um, based on that score or based on that assessment, they are given a numerical score. Households that score an eight or above um, are considered to be most appropriately served by permanent supportive housing, scores of, a, of seven and lower uh, rapid rehousing, and generally households that receive a score of anywhere from zero to three um, are considered, they, they should be able to self-resolve their homelessness without an intervention. Um, in addition, we also prioritize chronic homelessness, which is a HUD-defined uh, term, and that's households that have been literally homeless for one year or more straight, um, or have had four episodes in the last three years that equal uh, 12 months. And in addition, which I, I see did not make it to this slide, they also have to have a disabling condition to be considered chronic. So based on this prioritization, those uh, households with the highest SPDAT score that are chronic are the households that are gonna be uh, referred, referred first um, from the centralized wait list. Um, I do want to mention, as I, I think has been brought up before, um, there have been some equity issues identified with the VI SPDAT tool. Um, most communities across the country are moving away from using that tool. Um, you know, in addition to the equity issues, it also never really was meant to be used as the sole determinant of, of where someone gets referred. It was supposed to be, it's a case management tool. Um, so through the work of the stakeholder committee um, and the work of the U of O capstone group that I believe presented to you all a few weeks ago, they, they have done a lot of research on, on other tools being used across the country. We're gonna move towards um, a new standardized assessment, which is an, a requirement of, um, of coordinated entry. And then I also just wanna add, um, you know, the TAC report talked a lot about avoiding referral buckets. And so rather than having a dedicated rapid rehousing list and a dedicated permanent supportive housing list, we should really have one list and make whatever resources available at the time available to who is the most vulnerable. Um, so in the current system, Someone that scores, say, a nine is going to score into PSH, but every score above them is going to be prioritized above them. And so we may have 25 households that are going to be scored above them for PSH, and then that makes them also not eligible for rapid rehousing because they're on that PSH list. But in theory, a score of a nine would indicate they have more vulnerability than a household with a score of a six. Um, and so if we move away from having a dedicated rapid rehousing list and a, and a dedicated PSH list, and instead look at who's most vulnerable um, and make what housing resource we have available at that time available to everyone who is most vulnerable, um, that will really ensure that we are connecting those households that need to be connected. So this slide kind of goes into a little bit more detail. The scoring summary, this is um, the scoring for the VI SPDAT. And so it's, it's broken into four domains um, and it's related to history of housing and homelessness, risk factors, social, socialization and daily functions and wellness. So again, it's a vulnerability assessment. So based on the series of questions that are asked in each of these domains, the household receives um, a certain amount of points which lead to their score. Um, you know, primarily folks that have been homeless the longest, um, folks that have additional risk factors like health issues, uh, mental health, those who have been victimized while being homeless, um, you know, those are the folks that tend to score the highest and score into PSH. We also will see households that access um, the ER frequently or access other crisis services like CAHOOTS. Um, those folks tend to be the folks that are going to be scoring the highest and scoring into PSH range. Um, and then just to clarify terms a little bit. So rapid rehousing is really intended to be a short-term housing relocation and stabilization program. So it's for those lower acuity households that really just need that temporary uh, rental assistance to be able to stabilize. And then once they have received that, um, they can continue to maintain their housing on an ongoing basis without that assistance uh, moving forward. And then permanent supportive housing is really aimed at those highly vulnerable households with a disability, those chronic households. 
um, that really need that ongoing housing assistance and subsidy and, and supportive services to make sure that they maintain housing. And, and there's not a designated um, length of stay for PSH. Also want to clarify, because I think the MLK Commons, the Nell and the Keystone are often the, the projects that are talked about when we talk about permanent supportive housing. But there's also several programs that use what's called a scattered site model. And so that's um, providers help folks get into rentals of their own in the community. Um, and so it's not a project base where everyone is living in the same building. Through scattered sites, sometimes it's what's called a master lease where the provider owns or, or holds the lease on the unit and then they can put clients in there as the leaseholder. And then sometimes it's just clients um, hold the lease themselves and through the support of the case manager at the provider they're enrolled with, they get those supports um, in usually in the form of home visits. These next two graphics um, highlight a breakdown of VI SPDAT scores from the last fiscal year compared to the referrals that were sent out from centralized uh, from the centralized waitlist last fiscal year. So as you'll see on the left, we had a total of 1,773 households. The vast majority of those household households scored into or, or were single households that scored into the PSH range. Um, then followed second by single households scoring into rapid rehousing. Um, family scoring into rapid rehousing and then family scoring into PSH. So the takeaway is really we have um, a very large percentage of our household scoring into permanent supportive housing. And then on the right, you'll see the referrals that went out from coordinated entry. So um, 291 referrals compared to 1,773 households last fiscal year. That's roughly 16% um, of households on the CWL are ever going to get referred to a housing program. So it's a very small fraction. Um, you know, you will see the highest number of referrals we sent out uh, was for single PSH households, which is a reflection of the need, which is which is good. Um, but I will also say that that number is influenced largely by the opening of the NEL um, and of the Keystone last year. So those were projects going from zero to full capacity. Um, so they were receiving their total number of referrals in, in one year. We would not expect to see this same number next year without increasing our uh, PSH or, or rapid rehousing inventory. So to, to see these numbers increase, we really need to continue to invest and develop um, in permanent supportive housing and rapid rehousing. Um, yeah, that's, that's where I was going with that. Um, so this leaves, you know, with 16% of households being referred, this leaves 84% of households that are not receiving any intervention to help them address their housing need. Um, and so we really need to take a look at how we engage these households in other interventions to help to get them housed. Right now in our current system, a household does a front door assessment, they get on the centralized wait list. Um, 84% of them will sit on that list for six months and never be referred to a housing program. And then after that six months, they have to do a new uh, front door ass assessment to maintain on that list. That piece is something that we're looking to change um, to not have that requirement of having to re be reassessed at six months. But the reality is there's a large percentage of folks that will not ever be referred um, in our current coordinated entry system. So we're looking at kind of a three-prong approach to help um, engage those households and hopefully then get them housed as well. And that's through prevention, uh, landlord liaison work, and then a diversion and rapid resolution approach. I'm gonna get in more detail with diversion on our next slide, but you know, prevention um, through ORDAP funds that have become available, we're really focusing on how do we keep folks housed with our um, you know, low number of rental units available it is significantly harder to find housing for someone once they've lost it than it is to give them some supports to keep them housed. And so really that's the work of prevention. The landlord liaison position with the county is a, is a position that's really looking to develop um, relationships with private sector landlords um, and uh, real estate entities to help develop the inventory of available rentals um, of, of people that will rent to households that have recently been experiencing homelessness. And so that's both um, those scattered site folks that are in programs that are scattered site that I mentioned, but then also just these folks that are accessing coordinated entry that they may have the resources to pay a deposit and to pay their monthly rent, but they cannot get approved for units based on a variety of factors, just how competitive it is, you know, a lack of rental history. Sometimes it's criminal history in their background. And so um, the landlord liaison position is really working to 
increase that inventory of available housing. And then diversion and rapid resolution. So I do want to preface by saying, so diversion, rapid resolution, and rapid exit are all terms that are used that basically mean the same thing. It basically means diversion. Um, and so this slide is, is the model that's used by King County, Washington. And, and there are many communities across the, the country that do diversion incredibly well. Um, and you'll see on my next slide some of the numbers that King County has met. But this is kind of the general path someone goes through. Uh, for diversion. So the key is really around this brainstorming conversation. So, you know, when, when someone is experiencing homelessness, they're in a crisis and they're in that fight or flight mode. So they may not be thinking about what social network resources they may have or, or you know, family, friends, coworkers, someone they may be able to rely on um, that could get them um, stably housed. And so through diversion, really skilled caseworkers um, engage those clients in problem solving conversations to kind of look within that household's current universe of support and identify um, potential resources to exit them to permanent housing. Um, and then it really the key is is using some financial assistance that's offered through the diversion program to help uh, make those connections. So some examples of, of diversion that have worked well you know, it's folks that identify, oh, I have this family member that lives in Nebraska that I could go live with. I just have no way to get there. So diversion could assist with a bus ticket to get there. Another example that we've seen come up before is, um, you know, household is working regularly, just barely paying their bills. Head of household, you know, drives for Uber. Car breaks down, they can't pay their 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 car repair bill. Diversion could help assist with that car repair bill to ensure that they then are able to maintain employment um, and then remain housed. And so the goal with with diversion, as with all of our programs in coordinated entry, is really ensuring that households are exiting to permanent housing. And this next slide, I think, I mean, these these numbers to me are in, incredibly impressive. I, I was surprised when I when I came up, uh, upon this slide, but again, this is from King County, Washington. So. Of the households that were engaged in diversion, almost 90% did not return to homelessness within six months, um, and 82.6% did not return within a one-year uh, period. So that's just phenomenal. Um, about 80% um, were diverted into their own rental without a subsidy. 15% um, had an ongoing subsidy, and then about 9% um, were diverted, diverted to living with friends or family on a permanent basis. Um, for me, the real key on this slide is at the bottom. Um, diversion is incredibly cost-effective when it's done well. So on average, um, in King County, households that were um, helped by diversion, the average assistance amount was $1,668 um, compared to significantly higher numbers for um, folks that were exited from emergency shelter, shelter transitional housing, and rapid rehousing. So, um, it is incredibly. It is an incredibly successful approach, and it is incredibly cost effective. Pivoting a little bit, um, I, I want to also talk about the the work, the strategic work we've taken on with the coordinated entry outreach team. So I think, as I've mentioned um, in this presentation, currently, uh, well, well, prior to about six months ago. Um, Households were added to the centralized wait list, and then they were not engaged until the point that 16% of them were referred. Um, and that often would lead to situations where referrals were being sent to providers after a household had been on the CWL for you know, maybe three to four months. Um, that often led to contact information had changed. Um, they had moved around. We, we no longer knew where to find them. And so often we would send referrals to providers and they just couldn't make contact with those households and it would just delay the process of being able to get someone into housing. So within the last like, six months, our coordinated entry outreach team has started engaging households um, that, that are in that kind of prioritization criteria. So those folks that are near the top of the CWL are immediately being engaged by coordinated outreach the moment they enter the CWL. So our team is reaching out, contacting them via uh, phone, email, sometimes it's going to providers, sometimes it's going out in the community via street outreach um, and engaging with them. And it's really making sure that we're starting the process um, of getting them ready for referral for the time when that referral comes. Um, and that really has cut down on the number of inactive referrals that are sent to providers. Um, 
a key piece of it is the document collection part. So, you know, when a household gets enrolled in rapid rehousing or permanent supportive housing, there are a plethora of document pieces that they're required to have. So there's state ID, there's uh, verification of income, there's verification of disability, there's um, just a variety of, of things. And so rather than waiting to work on those things until point of referral, our team now immediately starts working on, on those things with them so that when they get referred, they immediately can be enrolled and hopefully move into housing. Um, additionally, we're really using those case conferencing meetings I, I mentioned previously. Um, we have three separate bi-weekly case conferencing meetings. We have a single specific one, a family household one, and then a street outreach focused kind of coordination meeting. Um, and so through case conferencing, we're able to talk about, you know, this household is, you know, just missing their ID piece, who can help get them ID, their ID this week. Um, it's really focused on housing. So it's what what is the barrier this week to getting them housed and how do we fix it? And also this is a way that we, we help to um, not only just look at that SPDAT score, but also look at the relationship that the provider has and, and things they may know about the household's uh, needs and barriers that, that weren't captured through that SPDAT. And so what this has led to is really uh, what's called dynamic prioritization, which is kind of looking at the, the full situation of the household and not just going based off of assessment score. But it's also led to us having a queue of folks that are ready for referral, that have everything that they need. So the moment they're referred, they can move, immediately um, be enrolled. And this graphic really highlights what this work has done uh, for us so far. So Prior to implementing the, the work of the coordinated injury outreach team, um, when MLK was opening, um, the average day from referral to enrollment was 78 days. Um, since implementing this more strategic approach uh, for the NEL, it was an average of 27 days. So that's a dramatic decrease in time spent homeless for households that are experiencing homelessness. Um, and I will add that you know, our goal is to kind of move uh, to working with families, to working with households, you know, kind of in the rapid rehousing range. It's really about focusing the work on where we can anticipate the referrals are gonna be coming from. So we knew through the NEL there was gonna be 50 households that needed to be referred. So we focused on those single adult PSH households. Um, but in the upcoming year, if we see we're gonna have X amount of, of rapid rehousing family spots, then this team will really work with families to get them document ready. Um, so it's just about ensuring a much shorter timeline. Um, and, and, and this is really a credit not only to my team who does amazing work, um, but also to the providers that are involved with the case conferencing efforts, because that's really where this coordination happens. And, and right now, I think at last count, we had 12 different providers um, that are participating in case, or in, uh, case conferencing. Um, and it's just allowed for um, such an increased coordination that I think you know, this slide really shows how, how it's benefited coordinated entry. And this last slide, I know this has been a lot of information. Um, so this, I want to talk a little bit about where we're, at, where we're at kind of with our coordinated entry system map, um, and then where we're hoping to go within the next, next six months to a year. Um, so as you can see here, currently, um, households experiencing a housing crisis, um, when they kind of go through that maze of, of knowing where to go, and they end up uh, either having you know, being engaged by a street outreach team or they're directed to a front door site. Um, that now in our current system um, leads to them immediately doing this uh, VI SPDAT vulnerability housing assessment tool. Takes about an hour, incredibly personal questions, leads to about 85% of them sitting on a, a wait list for six months and they're never gonna get any assistance. Um, so what we're moving towards is increasing access. So that, that piece I was talking about of how do we capture more of those households on the HBNL. So rather than just uh, relying on in-person front door sites and street outreach teams, we're gonna supplement that with web access um, and telephone hotline access, which will also include an app. Um, and that will be managed by 211. Um, and, and that'll really open up the opportunities for, experience, or for folks experiencing homelessness to access coordinated entry, but also for community members who, you know, they have an unhoused person who is, is living in an empty lot next to their house, or they see someone at the grocery store and they don't know how to connect them. Through this approach, we'll really advertise that this is how you connect unsheltered folks in our community to coordinated entry. And that can be done. Someone could go online as the community member and say, you know, I, I really want to see help for this person. And then that'll kind of start to cue the process. Um, 
through that um, hotline web access and continuing those in-person uh, engagements, this is where we'll route folks through that rapid resolution and diversion conversation. So um, two-in-one operators will do a little bit of the screening uh, when they first are communicating with someone reaching out um, to, de to determine if there is um, you know, some way that we can use those diversion funds to help exit them to permanent housing. And then the coordinated entry outreach team will really do the case management and uh, and case work around um, that financial assistance when the time comes. And the hope, as always, is that you know folks are are bypassing having to access the shelter system and, and can go into permanent housing as quickly as possible. If that rapid resolution conversation is not able to um, result in the household exiting to permanent housing, that's when we're going to start talking about shelter. So. The goal is to have um, a shelter assessment paired with a real-time shelter inventory. So right now, when folks are looking for shelter, uh, they pretty much have to call every single shelter in the community to find out when a, where a bed, if a bed's open and what to expect. So through a real-time shelter inventory, we will have um, both via the hotline and via a web page, folks can go every day and it'll be updated with these are the beds that are open tonight, um, and this is what you can expect. It's a shelter that uh, you can't bring your pet, you can't bring a partner, um, so that they know what's available and they can go directly to the shelter that's going to work for them. Um, a long-term goal with that will be doing direct referrals via coordinated entry for shelter. That is something we previously have done with the COVID hotel shelters and found quite a bit of success with that. Um, but there's going to have to be a lot of conversations with our shelter stakeholders about what that referral process will look like. So that's gonna take some time to engage those partners, but it's a, it's a goal uh, of ours that we have. And then for those households that that are you know, not wanting to access shelter or unable to access shelter, we'll continue to use uh, utilize street outreach teams to help ensure that they have their basic needs met um, and have those survival supplies available to them. So through that outreach case coordination meeting that I mentioned, um, we already are deploying street outreach teams to all areas, uh, geographic areas of the county, um, and specifically to hot spots that we hear about where folks are at um, to ensure that um, folks are getting engaged in coordinated entry in those areas and that they're getting those survival supplies. After folks have kind of stabilized either through shelter or through street outreach engagement, only then at that point is when we're gonna start to do that full vulnerability and housing assessment. So the goal is really um, let's not spend an hour asking all of these really intense questions about your vulnerability without engaging you in some other way. And so only then, if we have not been able to resolve their homelessness, will we move to that vulnerability assessment. And the long-term goal is to, you know, we want to have a no wrong door approach. So we want to continue to use these front door sites, but we also want to utilize um, roving ass assessors that kind of move through the system. So um, it's taking a little bit of the pressure off of these uh, nonprofit providers to, to need to be um, doing all of these front door assessments. And hopefully we can have some assessors that kind of just move through the system and go where people, people are at. Um, again, you know, the goal is always exiting households to permanent housing um, as quickly as possible. So just in closing, I kind of want to give a timeline, um, you know, things we've started, things we're starting soon, and things we're, we're going to be hopefully uh, completing within the next um, six to 12 months. So the things we're already doing, we are already engaging street outreach teams, uh, doing front door assessments. We already have those front door sites that we are directing households to, um, to get that assessment. And we have really well coordinated street outreach teams covering the full expanse of Lane County to really ensure that we are engaging those folks that are living in unsheltered situations. In the next three to six months, we're really um, hoping to get the two on one uh, access points up and running. Um, and then that rapid resolution and diversion piece um, utilizing our coordinated entry outreach team. And then the longer term goals, which I, I think I already mentioned, um, are that that direct shelter referral piece. And the reason that's a little bit longer is that's just a real big change to how um, shelters have operated in our in our community. And so we really need to be thoughtful about how we're doing it. And we really need buy in from the shelter partners. Um, we did already present to the shelter stakeholder um, subcommittee of the PHB um, about this model and folks were really interested in it. And so I think we have a lot of potential um, there, but it's going to take some time to work out those details. And then the roving assessor piece is another piece where we kind of need to figure out where that's going to live and how that's going to be staffed. But, um, you know, I'm 
really hopeful that all of these things will be achieved within the next year. Um, and I think we've already made um, quite a bit of progress and we've seen, we've seen the results from what we've already done. And I think it will only increase those results as we move forward. So that's what I got for you, but happy to field any questions. I know that's a lot of information all at once as well, so. Dr. Gray, I am truly impressed with this, with this presentation. Mr. Ewell, amazing. This is the most concise and clear to understand presentation that in all the years I've been working with the homelessness and, and programs, I've never seen anything quite this concise and clear. Thank you. Superbly done. I have one quick question before I uh, turn it over to the board with your indulgence. Um, could you step me through a real time situation? Um, and uh, there's a lot to say about the presentation and, and I'm gonna look up at Neil Moyer, if Neil can look at me right now to know that he's hearing me. He is. This presentation is fantastic. I'm gonna ask for some kind of a uh, capsule of this in a, uh, in a, in a uh, video form at some point. I got the thumbs up on that. So, um, <clears throat> real time, last night, after nine o'clock, I received a telephone call from a woman who I hadn't heard from for many, many, many years. Um, her son and my son had gone to high school together. Her son is living in a tent at Armitage right now. And she is, and her husband, she's re they're retired teachers. They're spending money to put them in a motel. But their money's running out. The savings are running out. This is real time. And that we've all experienced this kind of a phone call. Uh, and we're not the only ones that experience this kind of a phone call because, you know, People look toward us quite often to be to find the answers. <clears throat> so for her son, um, what shall I tell them at this point in time? What? So I'll say, uh, Mrs. Mrs. Monroe, here's what to do. Yeah, I mean, I think it goes back to to what I was talking about with with utilizing street outreach teams and using those front door sites. So we're going to continue to use those things until we get to this point of where we have increased our access. So. Um, you know, we have a Lane County, um, we call them the Rural Street Outreach Team, but it's really, they just cover areas outside of Eugene metro area. So um, we have a Lane County team that covers west from Eugene to Florence, um, and then also covers um, Junction City and Coburg. And then we're finalizing a contract with a provider for the balance of East Lane. Um, so our Lane County team actually frequently goes out to Armitage Park, and that's uh, largely due to an ongoing meeting I'm a part of with our Lane County Public Works staff. And so they identify through parks uh, contacts or through other properties that they're engaging folks where they're seeing unhoused folks that could benefit from street outreach. So, um, I mean, to answer your question, I would say um, the Lane County website does have the front door sites that are currently being used um, located on the coordinated entry website. Um, that information is admittedly buried and it needs to be brought to the forefront. And it goes back to that piece I was mentioning about it's got to be well advertised. Um, and so that's the direction we're, we're moving. But I would say for now, um, folks can access you know those resources through the county website um, the coordinated entry outreach team has a phone line and an email address that folks can reach out to and we can connect with them um, and, and get them um, assessed via that team um, but we're really currently still relying on those front door sites that we're advertising and so that's where i would would direct folks to so i'd say go to the lane county website navigate it and, and uh, it would be incumbent on me or Vice Chair Trigger or whomever is answering this question to know how to navigate right. it. Uh, yeah, and I mean, I, I think paired with that, the hope would be through these really strategic street outreach efforts, we would have engaged this person at Armitage before they would have needed to go on the website to, to find those resources. So that's the strategy we're using. Um, but admittedly, there's, there's work we need to do um, to increase that, but, but yeah. And what I often suggest to people is once you get to the Lane County website, there's a search feature. And so if you just search coordinated entry, that page does indeed come up and the front door assessment sites are listed right there. Thank you, Ms. Ms. Bud. Um, very good. And then um, so the 211.org, um, is that an option for people to use it? in their situation also yes it is um and I, I can't remember the exact numbers they shared with us but i believe they said in the last fiscal year something like fifteen thousand calls they re received from lane county of folks um calling related to a housing crisis um and so you know they have an established um 
presence already in our in our county, but we're really going to expand how we advertise that. Um, you know, before coming to the county, I previously worked at Looking Glass and was a part of the the Safe Place. Uh, you know, so you see those yellow signs at Dairy Mart and on LTV buses. Um, I would really like to see something similar with coordinated entry. So, um, you know, at the convenience store that's open 24/7, there's a sign that says this is a coordinated entry access point, and they are, you know, those those staff are trained like. This is how, you know, we call it two and one. This is how we get them connected. And, and they know that when they come into contact with, with an unhoused person in crisis, that's how they they access it. And hopefully that'll take away from that burden of, of um, kind of having to dig for that information. Thank you very much. And to the board, what I just did was I did exactly what Ms. Budd and Mr. Yola told me. I went to our website. I searched coordinated entry and I got, came, I'm looking at Kate Lane County's coordinated entry. and. Uh, Stephanie very easily drives through right there. So it's not complicated, just knowing exactly what to do, which should be relatively easy for us to advertise and uh, finding ways to, so that people who, people who aren't reached by the outreach team or whatever barrier is in place, whether they're hiding, you know, they're, they don't want to be reached by the outreach team, um, finding ways to get them to enter without, uh, you know, get past the barriers that are income, I'll use the word incumbent again, that really are present when people are trying, need to be, to get assistance, but sometimes the barriers are in place. Thank you very much for that indulgence to the board, then I'll turn it over for questions. And uh, uh, with thumbs up from Mr. Moyer regarding the encapsulated form of this, that we can all review it and uh, also present it in other, in other venues. My gosh, I'd love to do that. <clears throat> to the board. Uh, uh, Commissioner Buck. Thank you, Chair. I am also very impressed everything that you presented today. I'd love to see these slides attached to the agenda. Um, I, I noticed it, in this meeting and the, and the one that we had for our affordable housing action plan, the slides weren't necessarily attached to the agendas. I, I really prefer that because I want the public to be able to see them as well um, and refer back to them. And I refer back to them quite a bit and they're very helpful. Um, I, I, uh, I came with a particular question today and um, you have touched on it with the direct shelter referrals. And uh, mine relates to that, but actually the next step up, which is people still have to go to different entities, get on their waiting lists for you know some kind of more formal housing strategy. And it sounds like it, you're starting that conversation with at least the shelter portion of of all those different places because um being on 10 or 15 different wait lists is highly unrealistic for most people that that may not have the means to be able to do that um and this could be a really great start you know especially through you know the immediate shelter needs and i can see how that can be a very complicated conversation because each provider has different rules and regulations that they're operating under or they have, they're operating um, within a particular grant that, that only this kind of uh, you know template of person and, and circumstances can can be sheltered in that situation and you multiply that by all the different providers and all the different grants that they have out there that gets real complicated real fast um, maybe with the shelter it won't be quite uh, as complicated since it's immediate, but I, I like to eventually get to the place where we've got folks that can enter in one spot and say, these are all my circumstances. These are the providers that actually have housing available for me. So I don't have to get on 50 waiting lists. Um, it, it, it just seems more streamlined and, and more efficient. Um, and I am glad to hear that you're starting somewhere with that conversation and maybe it will lead to that eventually in the future have you had those kinds of conversations yet yeah and i and i think some of that's the the role of the landlord liaison position as well um is i think to really engage those community partners that that have their own housing wait lists and, and how can we um get them on board with kind of partnering with coordinated entry and so i see that role really kind of taking the lead on that and we're we're in the, the middle of of uh hiring for that and so we had someone and now we're we're finalizing hiring a second person so i think that'll move forward really quickly but i, I think that's a great point i think we need to um 
to really have a truly centralized housing wait list, we have to have all of the wait lists included uh, within that. I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, I was trying to wrap my head around the homeless by name count versus the central waiting list, which you're right, like most people will never understand the difference unless you're really in the center of it, right? So from my understanding is anybody that's accessing some services at any of our social service agencies or providers throughout the county will get at least a brief intake of some sort to get on the homeless by name count. But they have to have a more thorough assessment to be on the central waiting list. And people, it seems there's two issues there. One, that larger amount of, of folks are not getting that thorough assessment. But also for those that actually are able to do the more thorough assessment, there isn't enough resources or housing available for them to actually go anywhere with that. Um, I'm, I'm thinking the ones on the wait list, the central waiting list are the ones that will be transferred to say the navigation center. Yeah, and thank you for bringing up that. That's a piece I didn't touch on enough. Yeah, the, the households that are being prioritized for the NAV Center are those folks that are meeting that, that high prioritization for referral. And so it's the, the folks we anticipate referring um, out to a housing program within the next um, three to six months. So yeah, those are the folks that would be referred for NAV Center, yeah. One thing I do wanna to touch on with, with the HBNL, which I also meant to mention is, um, for our outreach coordination, I, I routinely look at the HBNL and, and there's a lot of data captured in there. But one thing that has been continually um, concerning to me is that I will see folks who have been homeless in our community for 20 years on the HBNL that have never been connected with coordinated entry. Um, so, you know, I think it's a mix of how do we engage those households that aren't gonna be referred through things like diversion and prevention, but we're also not capturing all of the incredibly highly vulnerable folks, because if someone can be homeless in our community for 20 years without engaging in coordinated entry, I would, I would guess their vulnerabilities are pretty high. Absolutely. The only final thing I wanna to touch on um, is we used to have this thing called winter strategies. Now it's all hazards, right? And we are, but, but winter is still one of the most severe that we foresee uh, and I like to see conversations about what we're doing in the summer, which is now. <laughs> and so I'm curious if we'll have a different presentation about what we're doing on that, um, if it's periodical hazards or if it's going to be something a little bit more specific about what's coming up this winter with, with what we see as resources coming our way, especially from Oregon Housing Community Services, because um, uh, I've had some challenges. We've all had challenges with Oregon Housing Community Services and what resources are and are not going to be available um, for our most vulnerable in, in these really challenging seasons. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Commissioner. Vice Chair Trigger. Thank you, Chair. Well, I will um, echo and use Commissioner Buck's comments as a jumping off point to really appreciate the robustness of the presentation, the clarity of the presentation, the usefulness of it. And I also made a note about linking the slides to the agenda. And I know that's you know, it's an operational, not a policy decision. So offline work with staff, I know that preparing them takes time and your packet has to be to us quite a bit in advance. So operationally, if it's possible even to retroactively link them uh, to the agenda, that's fine. I just think by the time it comes to us, the public should be able to open the slides and not necessarily have to watch the video to, to receive the content. So just a, another push for that from me. Um, this also just really points out, you know, we asked a while ago to dedicate more time to these updates, and this is why. There's so much good work happening, and it's really invisible. I was talking with Director Gray yesterday at the Navigation Center opening that to the general public, the successes are invisible. So people think, quote, nothing's being done about homelessness in the community, and this demonstrates clearly how we're both working at the individual level, but also at the systems level to continually improve. And you all are the content experts. We can't possibly absorb and then restate all of this back to folks. So knowing that we can refer people to this presentation and these slides, um, or I can refresh myself before responding um, is, is really wonderful, but I also just want to acknowledge how responsive the staff in the housing division has been when I have had constituents or other people asking me for information that you're always willing to 
have me forward an email and, and have you engage in the conversation. So thank you for not only the great work and the clarity of the presentation, but your accessibility um, to folks in the community. My, I have a couple of questions. One is um, sort of related to what Commissioner Buck brought up about the Navigation Center. If you could just talk a little bit more looking forward to the relationship between the Navigation Center and the coordinated entry and the central wait list once things are really rolling and it's been operational for a while. And also clarifying for folks, because I don't think we talked about it this morning, that the way people even get to the Navigation Center is through referral as well. So we could talk a little bit about the interaction of referrals, Navigation Center, and coordinated entry. Yeah, so we've, we've started to have the conversations with um, the Equitable Social Solutions staff about that. Um, we're slated to send the first 15 referrals over to them on Monday, um, and we're actually having a separate uh, smaller case conferencing meeting between our staff and the Equitable Social Solutions staff. Um, but the model is that so... You know, currently we, we we have households identified that kind of meet that prioritization that are going to get referred to housing. And so our coordinated entry outreach team is already engaging them um, and is, is discussing the NAV Center with them. So we were able to tour it last week. And so I feel like our outreach team really has a, um, a lot of knowledge and, and knows how to communicate it to the folks that they're working with. So they are given that opportunity um, if it's something that they want to do. Um, and from that point, we, we have those case conferencing meetings where we have kind of a what we call a warm handoff to the equitable social solution staff. So we're um, talking about what the household needs are, um, what the barriers may be, um, and ensuring a smooth transition into the NAV Center. For the households that are moving into the NAV Center, um, the equitable social solutions team will kind of take on that housing navigation and document work with the folks that are residing there within the within the facility. You know, there may be some overlap based on previous relationships that have been built. Outreach engage, engagement is all about rapport. And so if a, if a household's really connected to one of our outreach workers, then they'll probably continue to do that work. Um, that then will allow, you know, there inevitably will be households that choose to not access the NAV Center, and our outreach team will then do the housing navigation and document collection work with those households um, while, while Equitable Social Solutions is hand handling the households that are residing at the NAV Center. Thank you. A couple of follow-ups. So how many chances does somebody get to say no thank you to the Navigation Center before they sort of lose their spot in line? You know, because somebody might not be ready the first time, but they're still just as vulnerable or as eligible. Sure. Uh, I mean, uh, I wouldn't think they would lose their opportunity. Um, I think it's something that we're going to continue to to talk with folks about, and and we've we've talked with ESS staff about how there's probably going to be some back and forth. Um, I think there will be a, a a period of time. Word of mouth is so powerful um, that it's going to take some time for the NAV Center to get the word out that this is a place we want to go to, and so we we are going to hit some uh, probably some some initial kind of. We're not so sure about the NAV Center, and I think uh, over time, as we build um, the word of mouth, and we're also working on um, like a video orientation that would, that our outreach workers can show folks that like shows this is what the facility looks like. So, um, yeah, that's that's our goal. But I I am not aware of there being any uh, time limit or or you know they could as many opportunities as they need. Perfect. Thank you. That's exactly what I was looking for. Because I think all of us, right, we're looking for a service. The first thing we do is we talk to our, our peers, yep. our friends who've experienced that service and yep. say, who do you recommend, whether it's a car mechanic or a dentist or, or a shelter? Yep. Um, similarly, I would imagine thinking about the vulnerability index and case management, is there any way that we capture or understand how many people decompensate and have reached a level of vulnerability that they wouldn't, that they weren't, would never have reached if we had been able to serve them sooner. I mean that, that idea of continually serving the most vulnerable makes the most sense. Make no mistake, I'm I'm all for it. But then we have this whole group of folks because of a lack of resource that become, uh, you know, that that move into that category because we couldn't serve them sooner. Is there any understanding of what that relationship? Is? I mean, I th I think we see those folks come up a lot in the street outreach coordination meetings, um, and, and also in the you know. So part of our case conferencing meetings is is it's not only um, talking about those households that haven't yet been referred, but it's talking about those households that may be facing exit from a program. So, and, and often it's those folks that have, have, have decompensated to some degree. Um, and so, so through case conferencing, we're really trying to ensure not only getting households into housing quickly, but maintaining those households that are there. And so that's really a, an opportunity for us to engage 
you know, Lane County Behavioral Health or, or other community partners that we have to, to really wrap around um, folks that may have decompensated while they're in housing. And then really, you know, our street outreach coordination meetings is another place where, you know, in that meeting, I think we have closer to 15 providers that are a part of that. Um, and we're really discussing who are these folks that, that we are all seeing, that these outreach teams are all seeing, which tend to be the folks, um, you know, with the highest acuity and the folks that oftentimes, um, you know, we have seen kind of over time, um, you know, start to start to decline. Um, and then I did want to mention too that you know through permanent supportive housing there also is what's called move on uh, vouchers. So the goal is you know to get folks to not have to rely on permanent supportive housing forever. Um, and those are also conversations that happen in case conferencing. You know is is this household ready um, to, to move on um, and and to no longer need um, that PSH spot. Thank you. So my final question is I'm hearing case conferencing coming up in every different aspect of this this work that really is the key right and that that's um you know diversions the most cost effective it's least traumatic it's um it's the most sort of person-centered way uh, approach most individualized so what do we need to do to increase the number of people that we're helping through diversion do we have do we, you know what's our capacity around case con I mean, case conferencing is more than just lane county's own uh, team right so just thinking from for our responsibility and from a policy perspective, what do we need to increase the capacity to do more around case conferencing and, and beef up that, that divert, get more folks into that diversion track? That's a good question. I don't know, Kate, if you have thoughts. I, I mean, you know, I would say the case conferencing and the diversion there, there's some overlap, but they're almost kind of, the, the folks that are, I, the, I see the folks that are going to be served through diversion likely aren't the same folks that are going to be talked about in case conferencing, um, because diversion, I think, is really intended to be that, that immediate kind of light touch. They don't have a case um, to be conferenced. Right, yet, right? exactly. <laughs> um, and so I kind of see them as two different, different things. Um, as far as kind of increasing the capacity for diversion, um, you know, I think that we, um, you know, a lot of this is, and we're looking at a lot of diversion best practices across the country. Don't so I don't want to imply that we're winging it, but I do think there is a level of trial and error here um, that we're we're working um, to figure out. And, and one thing I often say is we're not going to get to a point where coordinated we've we've coordinated entry is 100% perfect and we never need to to do anything with it again. Coordinated entry always should be adapted based on the individual community needs. Um, so we should be reevaluating our coordinated entry. Um, if not yearly more. Um, and so we're not gonna get to a point where we've we've created the best system. It's, it's always gonna be adapting. And so I think we'll learn a lot in the next three to six months. And I may have a better answer for you at that point, but um, yeah. And I'll add communities that I have seen who have been able to increase their diversion capacity uh, has been through flexible funding because the key with diversion is flexibility and very much understanding from the household what their unique needs are as well as what their unique interests are around how they see uh, their needs and what help they need. Uh, because often, you know, folks may come to the table and, you know, I may see they need housing, but they may come and say, I actually need childcare because I've got a job lined up. I've got a house lined up, but I have nowhere to put my kids while I'm coordinating all those things. And so having flexible diversion dollars to be able to pay for childcare, for example, is really important, as well as recognizing that those critical, um, kind of motivational interviewing techniques that James described are also important. And so to be able to increase the staffing to have those conversations is also key. And of course, can be done through that flexible funding. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you, Vice Chair. Commissioner Bozovich. Thank you. Um, you know, I, I really appreciate the conversation around uh, diversion. Um, yeah, I barely made it on time to today's meeting because um, I was dealing with a crisis where um, some friends of mine that are living, you know, three adults in a, in a house together, the, the person that's actually on the deed and, and owns the house um, apparently was hiding a substance abuse issue and had a psychotic event over the weekend and is throwing the other two out. 
um, and I'm going to be housing one of those two people temporarily. Um, some way of dealing with, with diversion for the person that has a substance abuse could save three homeless issues, ultimately. Um, although all three are employed, um, you know, finding housing on as a single person in this market is so difficult on a single income. Um, and, you know, potentially a house going into foreclosure, sitting empty and not housing anybody, all those things are, are potential here. So some way of getting this dealt with early. I've already emailed folks at Behavioral Health about possible help. But that, that to me, catching it at that stage before you end up with a bunch of homeless people. <clears throat> I really, you know, I, I under, I had a slides with underlined, same thing. You know, I was going to ask you to provide them by email, but much better to attach them to the agenda item when we have them available, once, once they're available. I know it's kind of a pain for our staff to have stuff come late to be attached to the agenda, but I understand how slide presentations are worked on right up to the last minute. Um, and that's why they quite often aren't in advance with the, the regular board packet, but once they are, set and done be great to provide them to uh, diana or whoever uh, to get attached to the agenda um it's interesting um james that you come from looking glass you know my favorite one of my favorite charities um long time relationship with with craig and, and looking glass and this is where i have a question about the, the assessments and 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 the prioritization when it comes to youth, you're so well aware of the whole 15th night study and, and every day, every hour on the street is critical. And the sooner we can get them into at least, at least a temporary housing of some kind and off the street, the greater the chance that, that they won't become chronically homeless as an adult. So it, it, it's about the inflow pipeline to homelessness. But one of the things that's scoring is how long have you been homeless so you actually go higher on the list for how long versus is there is there a separate scoring for youth it is somehow or another do they get top priority for rehousing you know to me that seems like the the questionnaire about youth is you know time being homeless shouldn't even be it it, it you should automatically be a nine or ten you know so can you can you address that particular issue? Yeah, and I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. I'm actually presenting a very similar presentation tomorrow to the um, YHDP group that's working on our new youth-focused programs. Um, it is a coordinated entry best practice to have a completely separate youth coordinated entry system. And so we will be working on identifying um, a youth specific assessment tool that that may prioritize different vulnerabilities than the bi spadat does um and then in addition having a, a youth separate list so it kind of takes away that you know a, a youth that maybe has only been homeless for two years isn't going to be competing for um, a referral spot of someone who's maybe been homeless for for a decade um, because there'll be a youth designated list where we're referring youth out to youth specific programs um there's a lot of work to be done with determining the prioritization, um, both not just for youth, but also for the adult household. So, um, you know, as we move to a different prioritization criteria, um, you know, examples that other communities have used, there have been communities that have chose to prioritize youth um, or have chosen to prioritize folks 65 and older or medically fragile. Um, and then they're using the standardized assessment tool to kind of help influence that decision, but they're picking a, a real specific demographic um, as the prioritization. So I think there's going to be a lot of um, shifting as those prioritization conversations happen via our stakeholder groups um, and then you know we'll be presented to the PHB for approval but um, yeah there I'm glad you brought that up because there there really needs to be very youth specific um, coordinated entry practices um, and and it ties to the prevention and the diversion piece you know um, I certainly you know I worked at looking less almost 20 years and I see a 14 year old kid that I worked with who's, you know, now almost 40. And so um, we need to make sure that's not happening and that they're not remaining in our system, um, in our homeless services system. 
Yeah, and I think that also goes, you know, families with children. Yep. Because we all understand the adverse childhood experiences and how they add up, and homelessness is one of those adverse childhood experiences. So the rapid rehousing, the diversion, whatever we can do when there are children involved will be a long-term solution to our homeless problem because it, you know, those, those add up, those, those, those pieces. And, and as you add those up, the likelihood of chronic homelessness as an adult, substance abuse and mental health issues, all those just keep piling up. So, yeah, I, I was a little concerned when I was thinking about, you know, you know, youth and, you know, prioritizing somebody that's been homeless, you know, you'd start talking about somebody that's 20 years and has never been assessed, but you know, it's like, we're not going to, that trajectory of that person, you know, we can help project them maybe ultimately, but the real front end loading is, is the kids. So I appreciate you guys are going to take a separate look at that. <clears throat> Thank you, Commissioner Bozovich. And, uh, you know, talking about couch surfing numbers that we don't even know of kids who are right on the verge of uh, entering that population. Commissioner Bernie. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> um, when you were at Looking Glass, did you know Tyler Mack? Oh, yeah. I just talked to Tyler last week. I was going to donate a desk to them. He used to work for me at Big City Game and when oh, he was cool. a college student when I owned that's that funny. before I sold it to the young people I yeah. mentored. Yeah. That was great. Yep. Did you uh, ever know a guy named Jim Forbes? Oh, yeah. I was good friends with Josh, his son. Is that right? <clears throat> I would like to start before I ask questions by saying that while I agree it's good to have slides in our board packet and we never get them on the COVID reports in our board packet, and I would really like that to start occurring. Um, I also think that this presentation that you made, James, um, I'm going to have to agree with Commissioner Chair Farr on this. I think that not only your comprehensive understanding of the issue, but your passion for dealing with how do we work around stupid systems while we're creating another system um, for maximum efficiency, minimum redundancy, presuming that will create greater levels of service. To me, that's what rang through loud and clear, and slides don't convey that. So. Well, I would appreciate the slides. I really do salute you. This, I, I feel the commitment in your presentation. I really do. I mean that sincerely. Um, I also wanna say that depending upon the topic, um, a comment was made that commissioners don't have knowledge that you have the knowledge. Well, depending upon the topic, sometimes commissioners do. And I just wanna recognize Commissioner Buck because Commissioner Buck has spent a lifetime in this um, and I appreciate your poignant and insightful comments on this issue particularly. Um, I have no insight. I used to build low-income housing, but that's, you know, what the hell? That's not what we're talking about. I'd like to focus on two aspects of what you discussed. One of them is the landlord liaison work. What the hell is that? What does it cost? And what will we see different as a result of that? I might bounce that to Kate just because she has more of those details. So I'll start by sharing that it was at the recommendation of the TAC report uh, that was created a number of years ago, and it was one of the final recommendations uh, that we needed to move forward. And we started the initiative uh, about six months ago with uh, a lateral transfer position. And the key focus of the landlord liaison position is, is threefold. Uh, the first is creating a list of affordable housing housing options in the community, as well as uh, a list of landlords that may have more flexible screening criteria uh, that may make renting from them um, more attainable for people who have, for example, criminal records or have um, kind of negative uh, 
rental history or may not have uh, the level of income that someone may need to have kind of with regular screening criteria. Um, in my experience, uh, there are folks who need to have three or even four times the rent in income in order to rent, and that alone is a large barrier. And there are landlords that are willing to flex their criteria, especially if they know that someone is in a housing program here in Lane County. Um, and often that willingness is as a result of conversations with uh, either staff from those programs or the landlord liaison themselves. The other key focus of the liaison position is connecting with um, the many groups that uh, support landlords in the community. So, of course, there's the, the landlord um, association um, and making sure that, that they are um, engaged in the association, that they're hearing the concerns of landlords, that they're helping to provide facts related to the programs or the different resources that are available to help landlords um, either recoup costs that they um, had had acquired as a result of you know renting to someone who is in a program in the community or that they're just aware of the resources that are available should they choose to rent to someone in the community um, and then lastly the the final focus is around creating a more collaborative um, effort among those who are housing liaisons in our different agencies in the community. Um, there are actually at least four uh, housing liaisons uh, in nonprofits here in Lane County uh, who previous to this position had really just been working within silos. And so a group had has been created and will be continuing um, with the leadership of this landlord liaison role to help them work more collaboratively together to make sure that they're all not reaching out to the same landlords and that their influence reach a much broader array of landlords and also that they're reaching out across the full county as they're talking to landlords. So, thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, one point that I may emphasize that uh, that you made is around uh, risk reduction for landlords who agree to be second chance landlords. And um, there are some programs in the state today to help reimburse landlords who have incurred damages as a result of, um, of, of being willing to take a second chance on someone. Um, those programs have fairly low caps. And it may not adequately address the concern of, that the landlord has about risk reg regarding their personal investment. So I think that that is an opportunity for legislative advocacy for sure. Thank you. I agree with all of that. It's, um, in my opinion, it's tinkering around the margins in an environment where there is a rental shortage and landlords can increase, not decrease, the requirements that, that they have for rentals. Um, um, I'm a landlord. I've not been, I'm not, other than being a county commissioner, I've heard nothing about this. Um, would would your, would this program increase my willingness? You know, I don't know. So here's what I'm going to suggest for what it's worth. I'm not the expert. Um, in many of the developments I did, um, in order to get people to qualify for financing, um, we would create oftentimes with a state or a local unit of government, something called a loan loss reserve, where the bank would create a reserve provided by the state or whomever to guarantee that they would be receive their payments. And in exchange, they would um, finance people who were historically or otherwise unfinanceable for a particular property. I think the same concept applied here might provide a lot more meat on the bones um, of working with landlords if in fact we had a program, a system where there were dollars provided by, I don't know who, OHCS, whoever, maybe the county, maybe some of our um, dollars um, that we're receiving from these federal programs, but would be a rent loss or property loss reserve so that 
landlords would feel exceedingly comfortable as opposed to just, I've got a good heart and I want to help someone, but blah, blah, blah. Um, so that's just one thought you might want to explore. And if you choose to explore it, whether I'm a commissioner or not, I think I might be able to assist you a little bit. The other, is that okay? <laughs> the, the other item um, that I want to dig into is, um, James, you talked about things being well advertised. And I'm going to make a pitch. I've not been successful thus far, but I'm going to make a pitch for a difference between, I mean, obviously things need to be well advertised and messaging needs to be appropriate and available. Um, sadly, we don't have a hometown newspaper, which does a lot of journalism and reporting on local things as much as we once had when Tyler Max family owned, right? <laughs> that paper. But, um, but the other thing is advertised versus community engaged and empowered. Mm -hmm. I'm going to beat my you know, horse as long as I can saying, I think we also need to divert some funds to provide small stipends to people that actually live in some of these high risk areas um, to, to re that know who people are, that know where folks are living in tents, that have people knocking on their doors, that have to push people out of their private property, but people that are in the community that become, in essence, um, navigators for the street outreach people that, that will empower them They'll learn about county programs. They'll be able to direct people to the right folks, et cetera, et cetera. So that's just another thought. And finally, the 211 operators, are those going to be people um, in the Philippines or in India that um, oftentimes receive calls? I mean, how, how, what's that gonna look like? Yeah, my understanding is it will be primarily operators that are, are located in the Portland area um, where 211 is, is located. They are working on, and, and Kate, jump in if I'm misstepping here, but they are working on developing Lane County specific 211 operators. Um, you know, there will be some onboarding that we will do um, to ensure that, that those operators are familiar with the lay of the land um, as far as providers in Lane County area. Um, in the conversations I've had with them, um, I was impressed by their knowledge currently, um, considering that they're, you know, primarily in Multnomah County, but, um, we will have to do a little bit of work to, to kind of the nuanced specific, uh, layout of providers in our area. Last comment and cheer. Thank you for the indulgence. Um, I'm a big advocate of hiring local. I'm also a big advocate of educating and empowering local. Um, I don't know if there's a way, you guys know better than me, <clears throat> but if there's a way, I mean, that I can't believe there's no one of the non, there's not one of the nonprofits that might have someone that might be able to learn how that works, et cetera. But to the degree we can move these services more to be based out of our communities, I and I know there's times when that can't happen, but the more the better. And um, with that, I yield and thank you, Chair. <clears throat> thank you, uh, Commissioner Bernie. <clears throat> Excuse me, Commissioner Bozovich. Thank you. I just wanted to let the board and the public know that I got a text from Diana Jones as, as Commissioner Bernie started his comments that she already had the slides attached. If you hit refresh, they're right there. So <laughs> we speak and it happened. Diana delivers. <laughs> Although I still think slides alone don't convey the passion. That, that no, no, it was an awesome presentation. And I, I really you know, well thought out and really described the system better than I've heard it described. Mm -hmm. You know, we're not as bad as the legislature who thinks they are the universe. We sometimes think we are the universe, but actually the universe just revolves around us. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Is that Chair, how it works? <laughs> Chair, if no, I may do please. a quick time check. I know Ms. Budd had prepared some slides also on um, uh, in information for you regarding how our providers are doing in terms of our monitoring metrics, but uh, knowing that there may be other things on the agenda for this morning, if you would like us to defer that presentation, we can, or um, or she can do that. Well, um, uh, we have time. Uh, in fact, we could go on all day with this as far as I'm concerned, but I don't think uh, you know, we do have other business to attend to. Nothing is on the agenda for this morning other than perfunctory business, and our executive session has been moved to the afternoon. So with that, Ms. Bud, if, if can, is this something you could do in 10, 12, 15 minutes? Sure, I'm glad to. Because I have one thing to say uh, before you do, and in case I, I don't get a chance to say, we're talking a lot about diversion. 
and diversion seems to be by far the most cost-effective method. $1.6,000 compared to everything else being $10,000 plus. So we're looking at uh, four or five times the bang for the dollar on diversion. And just this morning, we had public testimony regarding a diversion issue. Uh, somebody who potentially has been kicked out of a place that they are living by a mix-up in or by a lack of coordination in rules between the city and the county. Uh, this is the kind of issue that we're talking about when we're talking about um, being flexible in diversion, seeking ways to uh, administer diversion, and uh, and finding ways within our power to keep people from going into homelessness to save us all those um, you know multi thousands of dollars. So I'm looking forward to your slides, Ms. Bud. Thank you. Okay. Yep. I have to say I appreciate the extra time we're able to spend on this subject today and this morning in order to make sure this all happens. Well, thank you. And I certainly appreciate your time, Chair and Commissioners. Uh, Kate Budd, Housing Manager with Health and Human Services. Um, again, thanks to James. I, I, too, appreciate his passion, his knowledge, and his devotion to um, this focus. Uh, very much as, as I've continued in my career, uh, I appreciate that the interventions around homelessness have very much moved from uh, a simple art to much more of a science, and that we recognize that that research and evidence-based practices are important to continue to research and pay attention to, as is the input of people with lived experience and those who are indeed in our programs or have recently exited our programs here in Lane County. So I've heard from this body the importance of understanding how are our programs doing, and that is of interest to my team uh, and certainly of interest to our our community. And we want to make sure that we are indeed in a continuous quality improvement loop, uh, recognizing that we can continue to do better. We need to do better. We have people who are sleeping on our streets every night. Uh, and so it demands that we continue to do better and paying close attention to how our programs are doing and what outputs and outcomes they are achieving and not achieving is an important part of that. And so as you're well aware, we just finished a fiscal year, uh, July 1 through June 30. Uh, and when we contract with providers, uh, we create what we call program plans. And those program plans have both outputs, uh, you know, how many people need to be served within a program, as well as outcomes that help us understand, you know, is this program actually doing what we hope they will be doing, such as exiting people to permanent housing. And so what I did is I broke down uh, the different programs that were funded in the last fiscal year by program type, and then just summarized what we saw regarding those programs. Uh, and at the end, we'll share how we are going to work with our agencies to continue this quality improvement loop uh, and help increase their achievement around both outputs and outcomes. So in summary, uh, we contracted this last fiscal year with over 21 different agencies that provided uh, 58 different programs related to both community action, so specifically child care or food insecurity, as well as homelessness programs. Uh, they provided um, uh, both kind of homelessness system related performance measurements that we specifically get from HUD at the federal level, as well as community action measurements uh, that we also report uh, to Health and Human Services up at the federal level. Um, what we found is that the, the vast majority of our providers did very well. They were able to achieve the outputs and the outcomes in their program plans. And as expected, you know, with COVID being that, that macro level challenge, Challenge, um, we did see that agencies um, may not have been able to achieve the, the high level of, of outcomes in particulars that we had asked of them. And I'll get into more specifics a little later. When we but I will mention that your slides have also been included. So they are available to us and anybody watching, we can follow with the slides on our screens. Thank you. Great. Thank you. 
And so when we look at that that macro level challenge of COVID for the providers, a few uh, commonalities include staffing challenges. Um, it's no surprise nationally we've seen a large turnover, um, both with, with nonprofits and businesses. Um, we also have seen challenges for our agencies in hiring uh, new staff members at, at all levels of the agency. Um, we have uh, heard from agencies agencies that because we have seen disruptions of campsites, especially in the last few months as we've moved out of COVID, it's more difficult to find clients that they've been referred from coordinated entry, for example. Coordinated entry may be able to say, you know, they're in Armitage Park, uh, but then they go there and, you know, the, the campsite may have been disrupted, and so they have to find them somewhere else, and that's been a, a real challenge. Um, we've also seen, and we've already discussed this too, the, the rents uh, for rentals have increased significantly as well as the screening criteria. And so it's just made it more difficult for our rapid rehousing programs and our permanent supported housing programs to be able to move people into uh, market rate rentals because of those increased criterions. So when we look at homelessness prevention, uh, we contracted with six different agencies uh, that provided eight different programs. And prevention is basically rent assistance coupled with supportive services for people who are in a, a rental situation um, that could be doubled up and they're paying someone rent or it could be in a traditional um, market uh, landlord tenant situation. And as James so eloquently shared, um, there is a great motivation to stabilize people in housing because it is much easier um, and less expensive than if they fall into homelessness and for us to be able to get them back into housing. And so there's been considerable uh, dollars that have been allocated to prevention. Um, within my team's realm, uh, we really only managed about 20% of the overall prevention dollars um, that were available in our community. Um, Stephanie Talbot, um, who oversees LIHEAP and the prevention rent assistance, she manages the majority of those prevention dollars. So when we look at the achieved outcomes and, and outputs of our prevention programs, um, we did see that the the Majority of the programs did indeed uh, meet their outputs as far as serving the number of people that were expected to be served. Um, the, the greatest challenge that we heard from the providers is that our households needed more financial assistance than originally anticipated. And this makes sense because the eviction moratorium went on longer than any of us could have guessed at the beginning of COVID. And so it meant that people who couldn't pay their rent accrued a much larger overall amount of past due rent than we had, may have anticipated at the beginning of the fiscal year. And so that meant our programs weren't able to serve as many people as they anticipated. Instead, they served fewer people with a greater amount of assistance. The next program is our community service and access centers. And these very much are our safety net providers in the, the different communities across Lane County. Um, they are a total of 10 programs among seven different agencies. What we heard from these programs is that um, the vast majority of them were able to serve uh, enough people to meet their outcomes. The agencies that, that didn't serve as many people as expected um, were closed or had reduced hours at the beginning of the fiscal year. And that makes sense because we were still dealing with the COVID crisis. Um, things were, were still not open as they are now. And so as soon as they opened their doors and they had a flood of people come in and request assistance. And not only did individuals request assistance, but they found that people were asking for more assistance or a greater number of resources than they had previously due to COVID. And, and that that makes sense um, because people had, had very much been struggling all throughout COVID. 
The other important thing regarding our community service centers that I think is notable is that uh, Centro Latino Americano greatly increased the number of households that they served during this past fiscal year. And it very much is um, attributable to their, their strong connection to the Latino community and the fact that COVID very much disproportionately affected our uh, populations of color in the community. And Centro was able to help address the needs that came up in the community. Uh, we're really pleased to be partnering them uh, with them uh, on a number of additional initiatives this current fiscal year and actually hoping that they uh, will consider providing culturally specific services at the Navigation Center uh, when we receive dollars from Oregon Housing and Community Services. So we're, we're pleased to partner with them more greatly. The other service provider that saw a significant uptick in just the needs uh, were Hope and Safety Alliance. Uh, they are a domestic violence, sexual assault uh, support center. And as you may be familiar, we experienced a significant increase uh, in the number of reported domestic violence situations during COVID. Um, this is very much attributed to people just being home and not being able to, to leave um, their their, their home, their um, you know, in, environment at such a regular level as they had prior to COVID. Um, and also that kids were in the house and that just increases the stress level uh, for everyone. And so Hope and Safety Alliance provided a much higher uh, amount of services than we had anticipated in the beginning, which I think is um, an enormous strength of theirs. So regarding food security programs, uh, we have contracts with three agencies for four programs. Uh, one that I think is, is worth noting is Upper Willamette CDC, uh, which is in Oak Ridge. And I checked in with that agency and, and they too said they couldn't get their doors open early uh, in the fiscal year due to COVID. Uh, but as soon as they opened their doors, they found that the need was, was much higher than they had previous experience prior to limiting their hours due to COVID. And so, of course, the, the overall need for food support is, is high across the county. Um, we did see that uh, the programs that were home-based, so Meals on Wheels, for example, grew significantly during the this past fiscal year, and, and that makes sense. People were homebound um, and very much needed to access uh, food because there weren't food, um, you know, dining rooms that they could go and visit. Instead, things had to be dropped off, and that was something that was COVID safe. Um, so the, the resources grew quite a bit this last fiscal year. Street outreach programs, we have four uh, programs um, among four different agencies. Uh, our street outreach programs grew significantly in this past fiscal year, uh, which is exciting because we very much need the support that they provide. Recognizing that engagement of people who are unhoused and on our streets is vital to connecting people with the overall system of supports that exist. Um, and so we saw that our outreach programs um, were very much able to meet their outcomes um, and and most were able to meet the, the um, overall outputs as well. Um, one that I think is, is very much notable is Laurel Hill uh, Center, which provides the FUSE outreach, which is our uh, frequent users of, of system engagement. And those folks um, have the very highest needs in our community, often uh, are admitted to the emergency department or to um, the jails, for example. And they did an excellent job of moving people from the street into permanent housing situations in this last fiscal year. So we also invested, and this was new uh, in this last fiscal year, in housing navigation services for the alternative shelters in our community. So for example, uh, Dust to Dawn, uh, which is an alternative shelter uh, that serves nearly 200 people in our community, um, had housing navigators that were dedicated to helping people um, reduce their barriers to housing, obtain 
green ID, for example, um, be able to make sure they're getting on affordable housing wait lists. And all of the different housing navigator programs were able to meet their outputs as well as their outcomes. And what that shows me is that the the targeted intervention of helping people reduce their housing barriers is effective. And that we want to make sure that as any new shelters are created, you know, whether it's alternative shelter like pallet shelters or it's a traditional shelter, that that component of helping people reduce their barriers and not just, you know, remain safe in the facility is paramount to helping them move on. And so that's an investment that we continue to make in this current fiscal year. Our emergency shelters uh, also did a great job of um, meeting their outputs. All of our shelters were, were full uh, as, as significantly as they could be throughout the fiscal year. Um, they did struggle in being able to move people out and into permanent housing. Um, and those housing navigation staff members, which came on um, toward the the third and fourth quarter of last fiscal year helped to increase those outcomes. Um, and so we expect in this current fiscal year, because we will have housing navigators in those programs for the full year, that we'll see those outcomes continue to rise within the emergency shelters. The other challenge, uh, which attributed to the lack of outcome attainment for the emergency shelters is the reduction in staff. And of course, if the shelter is not fully staffed, the number one focus is just on the safety and the management of the facility. And so it means that helping people move on and receive the more in-depth resource support um, just wasn't a priority of the emergency shelters when they weren't fully staffed up. And so again, it goes back to that need for the housing navigators, uh, recognizing that our shelter providers are, are doing everything that they can. So we did have one diversion program through shelter care in this last fiscal year. Um, they did very well in, in working to meet their outputs and their outcomes. Um, we are um, moving in a, a different direction. Instead, we're going to provide the diversion support in-house here at the with the county, um, coupled within our coordinated entry. Uh, and so this program in particular didn't continue, uh, but certainly their work helped pave the way for the success of diversion as we move into this current fiscal year. And then rapid rehousing, we talked quite a bit about that in the, the last presentation. Um, this is that uh, financial assistance for rent as well as supportive services. Um, and currently we have uh, approximately 190 households that have rapid rehousing assistance. Among those households, approximately 73 are searching for housing. And I added that because I, I think it's it's of interest uh, because we want to move people into housing as opposed to just simply searching as quickly as possible. But because of our challenges with the, the high cost of rent, screening criteria that are, are continuing to, to rise, um, we're struggling to get people into housing. And so a few things that we're focused on in this fiscal year is how do we provide training and technical assistance to our rapid rehousing providers to make sure that they are indeed following all the, the evidence-based practices that are related to rapid rehousing um, across the, the national level. The other challenge that I heard from our rapid rehousing providers um, is just that there's many different funding sources in our community that provide rapid rehousing. And of course, with every funding source comes different guidelines. And when you are seeing staff turnover, that training of, of staff can be a challenge. And so that was something else we heard from the providers, uh, which provides staff at the county an opportunity to provide more regular trainings and making sure that we have um, some cheat sheet guides for our agencies to utilize as funding uh, continues to change and uh, guidelines become more distinctive per program. 
And then lastly, permanent supported housing, which is our, our highest level of programming. Um, our agencies did, did well regarding meeting both their outputs and outcomes. And this slide shows that we actually have three different types of permanent supported housing here in Lane County. Uh, the first type that I think is most well known is what's called site-based permanent supported housing, which the NEL and MLK Commons are great examples of those. Um, and that actually represents the smallest number of permanent supported housing beds that exist in the community. Um, we have not yet, we have about 55 households that have not yet been housed. The NEL, of course, just opening that up will reduce that number very significantly. We also have uh, what we call scattered site, which is placing people in market rate units um, through our agencies in the community. Um, and we do have currently about 47 households that are searching for housing right now uh, on the, the, the general landlord market. Um, but we do have 318 households that are stably housed. Um, and I, I'd like to share that those individuals are housed you know, from Florence all the way to Oak Ridge. Um, and the Mackenzie Valley, um, because we recognize that, you know, they have become homeless in those areas and want to remain, you know, in those areas because it's their community. And then lastly, we have a number of HUD VASH vouchers, which are targeted to veterans uh, and who have the highest needs in the community. Um, and we work in partnership with Homes for Good, as well as the Veteran Affairs Office to be able to support veterans um, through these PSH programs um, and, and the VASH vouchers uh, that we have. So, so a robust number of permanent supported housing uh, beds uh, that exist here in the community and are stabilizing those who have the very highest needs. So I mentioned the program plans for each program and a few things that we're focused on for this fiscal year include taking a collaborative approach. Um, we continue to reach out to the agencies, want to understand more about you know, what are their challenges, how can we help support them, what technical assistance might they need as well as more formalized training. Uh, we did recently put out a capacity building request for proposal, uh, both one for just general capacity building, like hiring a consultant or being able to provide, you know, more hours to a staff member um, who, you know, can create a stronger infrastructure. And then also a separate request for proposal for technology. So buying tablets or computers that might help an agency serve uh, their clientele more effectively. And so we, we know that that's going to help our overall um, attainment of outcomes through our agencies. We also want to make sure that we're checking in with our agencies on a regular basis if they're not progressing toward their outcomes um, so that A, they're aware um, and B, that we've been able to have conversations about you know, what type of supports do they need? Or, you know, is there something going on that we don't know about and that we need to help address or brainstorm around? Um, and then we're also working, uh, I was here as, as was you when the University of Oregon staff shared the presentation around the homeless management information system. And one thing we all heard is that our agencies are having to keep separate databases uh, in order to track their data. And that, of course, is, is not uh, something that we want to see continue. Uh, we really want our agencies to be entering data into HMIS and being able to get their data out of it so that they can make data-driven decisions. And so we've embarked on an initiative with um, our data analyst team here at the county to create dashboards um, that are program specific and help not only my staff, but also the agency staff understand where are they related to achieving their outputs and outcomes at any point in time. And so I really appreciate the, the data analyst team and working with us on this and look forward to being able to share this with the agencies and giving them more autonomy over their very valuable data. 
And then lastly, uh, we've, we've discussed many of these developments on the horizon, uh, but I think uh, one that I will mention is the importance of diversifying partners. Uh, we recognize that, that COVID has very much affect, affected many specific populations, whether it's populations of color, um, people with intellectual and developmental disabilities, um, or the LGBTQ plus population. And so we want to make sure that we're working with culturally specific um, populations agencies and groups so that we can understand, you know, what are the needs of um, their communities and how can we help address those needs and make sure that they're well aware of the access points that exist um, so that their folks can very much get on the path for both shelter and longer term housing programs. So we're very appreciative of the conversations um, that we're having with those agencies and, and look forward to further partnerships. And that's everything. Remarkable. Once again, um, a tremendous amount of information. Thank you for getting the slides to us so we can uh, develop more questions. Unfortunately, we have run out of time for the board to uh, send questions to you, but I know that you'll answer qu any questions that may be directed to you online or uh, through uh, even telephone calls. Uh, you, you always answer the phone when I call every single time. And uh, once again, thank you for a truly amazing. Ms. Mokorajski, we are in good hands. Uh, the, the data that's presented today, the uh, the on the horizon uh, um, work that's being uh, uh, directed toward, I'm I'm just truly impressed with the uh, with the length, the breadth, and the depth of the on, on the of the presentation today. Wish we had the rest of the day to talk about it because I know that we could, but we'll make certain, uh, Mr. Mokrajski, that we get uh, another presentation, at least one more by the, before the end of this year, and hopefully two more before the end of this year, as we go through the seasons and things change and, and some of the things that are on the horizon become more in, in uh, directly in front of us. So once again, thank you very much. I apologize for no questions, Ms. Bud, because we all have lots and lots of them and we could go on all day, but a couple of things we do need to address before the uh, before the noon break, which we will break on time at noon today. Commissioner Bozovich. Very quick, if you could send us an acronym key the first slide had a bunch of abbreviations and I had no idea what some of them meant. Thank you. <laughs> there are some great ones on there too. The, uh, the L, L spat, dat, fat, mat. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you very much. Um, then we'll, uh, I'll uh, look uh, to the, uh, the ether and uh, see if Mr. Dingle is with us for announcements. Yes. Uh, Chair Farr, I am. I have one very brief one. We have filled a vacancy in my office, the administrative support uh, specialist, and uh, we filled that position with Kayla Miller, who will be starting August 15th, and that is my only option. Um, Mr. Dingle, thank you very much. Anything further? And I see no questions for you. Thank you for joining us on short notice and, uh, and being very concise. We'll move along to uh, administration announcements. Mr. Mokrahyski. I don't have anything, Chair, unless you have questions for me. Any questions for Mr. Mokrajewski? Uh, Commissioner Burning. Um, what's the status of the uh, general counsel search? Sure. Um, we have finalized the announcement. I need to check to see if we've actually posted the position. I'm not sure that we've, but it's, it's very close to being posted. Um, we have hired a recruitment firm, so we are working with Acumen. We worked with Acumen. Um, which is based here in Oregon, or uh, uh, executive search firm on a number of recruitments. Um, they were successful in finding us our current health and human services director, our current HR director, our current equity manager, um, as well as some other positions. So we have that search from that group has been reaching out on having conversations with um, staff and county council, with um, uh, colleagues across the organization and beginning to reach out to, uh, to do some of that recruitment. So the next step would be to post the position. Again, I'll check for you, Chair or uh, Chair Commissioner Bernie, uh, by this afternoon to see if the position has been posted and when it will be. So are we on track with this? We are on track. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. Thank you, Commissioner Brody. Then, uh, Ms. Mark, I just going to telegraph something myself. Um, as we get later in the meeting, we're all getting emails about the uh, recent uh, development in the district attorney's office, uh, the lack of prosecution on uh, on not just minor um, infringements, but uh, some of the major infringements, like um, you know, non 
felony DUII and other things that are not being prosecuted right now, we're all concerned, as is the entire county. And I wonder if it, uh, before the end of this meeting, as we get toward the end of the meeting, perhaps during items from uh, from uh, the from uh, the board, you can give us an update as to what it is that we are considering um, in terms of uh, uh, relief for the district, district attorney's office. But what, if anything, you know, I, I'm, I'll, I'll state that. Thank you. And that, once again, is another telegraph to give you an opportunity to think about it. Yeah. Anything else before we adjourn for the, uh, for the noon break? Then uh, against all odds, that clock is fast, by the way. <laughs> Um, we, we will be adjourning, uh, excuse me, recessing, and we'll reconvene for a public hearing um, at 1.30. So at the time of my gavel, we are recessed.